do want to sort of point out that today, the format is going to be a panel, panel type. So we are going to have speakers come up, give their presentations. There will not be questions during the individual speakers' presentations, but after all the speakers are done, they will start, we will start answering questions. We handed out paper so that you could write your questions. So if an individual speaker is saying something that you have a question about, please write it down so that we can submit it. We may not get to all the questions at the end of the day today, but we will compile all the questions. We will send them off to the appropriate people to answer, and then we will figure out a good format to get back to everybody what those questions were, whether it's on a website, a email, social media, whatever it may be. Does that explain everything for everybody? Is everybody clear on that? So I would appreciate, this is a very sensitive topic. We want to be, you know, courteous to everybody. We want to be courteous to your time. If we could be civil about it, it would be great. I know this isn't social media, okay? But I just wanted to put that out front because we are trying to do this more and more. And there may be a follow-up afterwards that we can come back and give more information depending on what we get from this. Okay? So if you help us, we can help you. Make sense? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Daphne. Daphne and I were the ones that tried to put this together. And we have been furiously working these last two weeks to try to make sure we had everything we could cover. Hello, I'm Daphna Michelson today. I'm the state representative from this area, um, also not an, an expert in taxes. Um, one of the things that is super fabulous about being elected is you have access to all the experts. So um, in terms of any decisions that we make or any um, questions that we have that are submitted by you, we go to the experts. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about how Colorado is unique in the fact that your elected officials do not have legal authority to raise your taxes. So Chaz can't raise your taxes, I can't raise your taxes, only you can raise your taxes um, because of the laws in this state um, called TABOR. So other people will discuss that, but it's, it's important for us that you have this information. Um, before we go further, I want every elect, currently elected to please stand up, currently elected in the room. There. there he is. Um, so, will you please introduce yourself? I'm Councilman Steve Douglas at large. I'm on my second term. And, and Steve lives around the corner. Jason McEldowney at large. I live uh, in South Long Beach Reunion, and I'm ending my uh, second term and a chunk of appointments about the last 10 years. I've been serving for 10 years. And so, we have. And, oh, sorry. Thank you, Patsy. <laughs> You're on the thing, so we're going to introduce you formally, but go ahead right now. <laughs> Councilman Melanakis, and I'm the Adams County Assessor, and I live in Westminster, but I'm very familiar with your area. Excellent. Thank you, Patsy. And now, all of the people who are running for office, because you might be aware that we're in an election period and you've seen ballots in your mail, so if you're running for office, please stand up. You're a candidate currently, um, and um, we'll start with Tanya. Don't introduce yourselves and go down. Can, can we keep the introduction to name and what you're running for? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Benjamin Huseman, running for City Council at Large. So, Nicole Frank, I'm running for Commerce City Council Ward 3. Will Jackson, running for uh, Commerce City at Large. Jake Wilson, running for Ward 3 at Commerce City. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to be here. Um, I'm trying to kill time. This is my husband who's trying to get the um, computer running. He is an IT expert, so <laughs> we're hoping that will happen. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing that we may not have mentioned is all of the handouts will be compiled and will be posted on um, on Facebook so that you can access them later. If you have further questions, you can share them with people who aren't here. Um, and we're going to capture and or live stream, depending on what IT person can do now that he's got the computer up and running. A big hand round of applause for Michael. <laughs> And I just want to say that, please, all this information we're going to give you here today is available somewhere. Um, we've brought some of it 
we're trying to be as transport transparent as possible with all of this and we do we know that it's kind of a chore to get that information if you need something let us know we may know where you see it all right so our first presenter carol Hedges. ready for me to go yeah you introduce yourself while your slide presentation is being pulled up good afternoon everybody my name is carol hedges i'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization called the colorado fiscal institute um, we spend our time trying to make Colorado a place where tax and budget policies support equity and widespread prosperity. I am the tax nerd that you're always worried about that's going to corner you at a barbecue and want to talk about that kind of stuff. Well, you just met her, and I'm here, and I have the privilege of talking to you a little bit today about uh, setting the context for how property taxes are, work how they're collected, how they're applied, and that sort of thing. And what are you doing? Which one? Mm -hmm. Which one? <laughs> That's a lot, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention I do a lot of presentations? <laughs> <laughs> it should say reunion, so let's go to uh, down, down to R. Yell out like a R. There we go. There you go. <laughs> um, my organization does this a lot because in Colorado, it's a unique, we're unique, we have a unique tax policy where we as voters actually make the decisions about the taxes that we pay. And so it's really important that, you know, Coloradans are really interested in making good decisions. They want their elected officials to make good decisions. And as, as taxpayers and voters, we want to make good decisions too. So we end up spending a lot of time, my staff and I, running around talking to folks about um, various kinds of tax policy issues. I'm going to start the presentation, um, which is going to come up here in a minute. Talking a little bit, I'm just going to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. I am going to first talk a little bit about sort of the broader context of what's going on in Adams County. Because as you all know, Adams County is growing really, really rapidly. And, it, and I'm going to show you some data that shows, that, that compares growth in Adams County with growth in property values all around the state. The interesting thing about growth in property tax, uh, property values is it's sort of a dual-edged sword, right? You don't really, I promise you, you don't want to be living in a district where your property values are falling. That is a very difficult situation because that usually means the economy is in really bad shape if property is falling. So, but when the, incre the, when the value of the property that you own increases, then probably your property taxes are going to increase as a result of that because what you pay in property taxes is a percentage of the value of your home. Now in Colorado, because we love to do tax policy in the Constitution, it's a little more complicated than that. It's not quite that um, A to B to C sort of a ratio, but uh, that's, that's the general idea. I'm going to let these guys continue to work and I'm going to yak for a bit. Oh, look at that! <laughs> I just finished this presentation, put this presentation together about an hour ago, so I think I could probably act out the slides. <laughs> the whole bit. So if things get too boring, we can do that as well. Thank you, gentlemen. You guys are great. Let's as somebody who makes that many presentations, it's really great to have somebody in the room who actually knows how to run the technology. So way to go, guys. So this is what I told you. Um, this is the overview of the uh, presentation. I'm just going to jump into it. So Colorado's population is expected to grow dramatically over the next few years. As you will see, this is a projection of where uh, this, the, the graph is a projection of where we are today compared to where we think we're going to be in 2050. But I've also provided for you the change in population from 92 to 2017. The grew, population in the state of Colorado grew by 62%. We're projecting, and the state demographer is projecting, that by 2050 we will grow another 51%. So things are changing. The, 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 the economy and uh, the value of property and all of those other things are kind of, there's more demand for them. So we see a lot of growth. Here's Adams County. I think this is fascinating. So you guys, I got the big O's for some of you about population growth in the state as a whole. Check out what's going on in the county. From that same period, 92 to 17, you saw a 71% growth in population in this county. And projected going forward, it's a 72% growth in the number of people who call Adams County home. 
That's going to make a lot of difference in a lot of things in your lives. And I won't go into them because you all know them. Um, I think this is an interesting chart um, as well. So bear with me again. I'm a nerd, right? So I have to have grass. So what this chart shows is net migration. That is in and out, like how many people moved in, how many people left. That can also be dying, just so you know. Um, for the period, um, the orange one is 10, 10 to 20. The blue one is uh, 0 to 10. And this is the cohort of people's age. This is how old they are, right? And this is the state of Colorado. And I want to compare that a minute to Adams County. You tend to be, the people who are moving to, tend to, to Adams County tend to be slightly older. Not older as in like my older, but older than the state of Colorado. And what this says to me is that you're going to have a whole bunch more kids in your schools, right? Because the people who are moving here are people who are in family forming years, right? And I think that's significant. And it's different, again, distinguishes Adams County from uh, Colorado. Adams County's average growth, or growth in average uh, weekly wage, you can see it's got a pretty good projection from 2017 uh, to 2016. And I want to show you how it's actually historically been below the state average, but it's actually catching up. So everything is moving in an upward direction around economics in Adams County. That sets the context, I think, for the conversation that we're going to have today. All right. This is like the funnest thing ever. I get to explain to you how property taxes work. Y'all got it, right? Y'all know this, right? Off the top of your head. I, I, talk, I talk about a lot of taxes. I talk about federal taxes and state taxes and all kinds of things. And whenever I talk about property taxes, I've come to the conclusion that whoever made them up, whoever invented them, whenever that happened, was just mischievous, right? They just, they were getting bored with rather regular tax stuff, so they did it differently when it comes to taxing property, right? So we have unique terms that don't make any sense anywhere else in tax law or in the real world, but they're specific to property tax law. So I'm going to work through a few of those to get, see if we can get us all on the same page. So this is an example of the property tax bill for a house in a district where they assess 80 mils on the value of that house. Okay? So let's talk about what that means. So this is the value of our house at $350,000. We're just going to assume that for a minute. I'll be talking about each of these separately. It's multiplied by something called an assessment rate. This is the first set of mischief. If you go down to the local Kohl's or Target, or I don't know, I don't know what the local shopping looks like around here. I haven't been here very often. And you buy a blouse, right? Or a shirt if you're a dude, right? You play, pay sales tax on 100% of the value of that shirt or blouse. So if it's a $15 shirt, you pay your property, your sales tax on the full $15. For whatever reason, in property taxes, that's not the way it works. You don't pay your, pro your tax on the full value. You pay it on a portion of the value that is established by what we call an assessment rate. So what that 7.2 really means is whoever owns this $350,000 house is paying their taxes on 7.2% of its value. Now, just to, so I can check in, did everybody know that already? Okay, is there anybody in the room that didn't know that? Okay, good, thank you, I appreciate that, because I don't want to talk about a bunch of stuff you guys already know. So, what's subject to tax in this situation is $25,000 worth of value. It is then multiplied by the tax rate. Again, mischief. Because if you talk about an income tax rate, it's a little complicated if it's a graduated income tax and you have marginal tax rates and effective tax rates, but it's always expressed as a percentage of your income, right? In Colorado, for example, you pay, say, you pay income taxes of 4.63% of the value of your total federal taxable income, right? Property taxes, we don't talk about it as percentages. I don't know why, but we don't. It's expressed as a bill, okay? And I'm going to look to my friend, the county assessor, to help me. A bill is one one thousand of a dollar, right? 
right? So one one thousandth of a dollar is what a mill is. And in this example, we got 80 of them. We got 80 of them. And that's how you then multiply that times the amount of your ta uh, house that's subject to um, taxation and you get a bill of $2,018. Okay. It's never quite, there's a few other things that need to go into this. That's the general way it works. Back in 1982, who lived here in 1982? Who lived in Colorado in 1982? Okay, raise your hands. Everybody look around. Okay. This is about, this is about what it looks like in, 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 for the state of Colorado. 50%, well actually 51% of the people who live here today were not born here. Right? I didn't ask you who, I, I didn't ask how many were actually natives. It's a different question. I happen to know a couple people in the room and I know that they weren't born here. But it is, so, so that's another thing that's pretty interesting. I would think it always plays out in an interesting way. But back in 1982, voters were, the legislature was concerned about the way property taxes were being administered across the state. And there were some practices that were occurring where county assessors weren't assessing using the same tools or the same approach to valuing property. And there wasn't any requirement that the value be regularly updated, reappraised. So the legislature said, let's try to fix that problem because property taxes are a really important source of funding for local services, whether that's county, city, school districts, etc. So they put together a package that would require every two years that your property got reappraised using a market value approach. That's the whole comparable deal, right? So that was the first thing that was in this constitutional amendment. Um, and so it had to be appraised every two years and had to be appraised in the same way, are the two things. But there was some real concern politically about whether or not this would pass voters. Because one of the th impacts of the um, not using, not assessing every, or, uh, every regularly was that, what's your name? Debbie. So let's say that Debbie and I live next to each other in a, in a uh, housing development. And Debbie bought her house in 1963, and I moved in in 1980. There were places in the state where Debbie would be paying taxes on the value that she paid for her house in 1963, and I would be paying taxes on the value of my house that I bought in 1980. Debbie might have thought that was a heck of a good deal, because she probably paid a lot less for her house than I did, but I didn't think it was such a great deal. This was the 80s. People were moving to Colorado. This needed to be changed. But if we're going to make these changes, People were worried about their long-term property tax bill. So there was a little sweetener added to this constitutional amendment that voters approved. And what it said is that going forward from 1982, the total amount of property taxes collected all across the state, no more than 45% of that could come from homes and no more than 55% would come from everything else because that was the percentage that was in place in 1982 when this constitutional amendment was adopted. All right, it just said we're gonna, we're gonna basically keep everything in terms of how many dollars we produce or we generate from property taxes, it's gonna stay the same as it, approximately the same as it was in 1982. But here's what's happened to actual value, right? When you look at the total value of property around the state, it was 45, 55 in 1982, but today, residential property, houses, account for 77% of the total value of property in the state of Colorado, okay? Because Gallagher was approved and required that we only got 45% of our property taxes statewide from homes and 55, approximately, from uh, commercial, there was one other thing that Gallagher did, and it put one other number in the Constitution, and it says that the assessment rate, remember that middle part of the formula, has to be 29% for every non-home piece of property in the state. So do I have any small business owners in the room? Anybody own a piece of business property? Okay, if you did, and you own that same $350,000 piece of property that I talked about in my example earlier, 
Instead of paying property taxes on 7.2% of the value of that property, you would be paying property taxes on 29% of that value. Okay? Back in 82 when this was adopted, it was 29% for commercial, 21% for residential. But when voters approved Gallagher that says you have to keep that 45-55 in place, and we've seen this differential growth in the value of property, that assessment rate on homes started to fall. So instead of you paying today of property taxes on 21% of the value of your home, you're going to pay property taxes based on 7.2%. Hang with me. The challenging thing that this creates for districts and for the state is that the growth patterns across counties and across communities are dramatically different. I highlighted a few of the counties um, in the metro area. I didn't lift up Denver, but you know it's in there somewhere. And if you'll see that Adams really is at the top in so many of these things. This is the growth in value in pro residential property and commercial property and then total property between 2014 and 2016. Your property's gone way up. The assessment rate is coming down because last time you got a property tax bill, instead of you being assessed at 7.2%, you were assessed at 7.96%. But because your property grew much more quickly than the state average, your, your mill levy is going to go up, or your, your uh, property tax bill is going to go up even if the mill levy stays the same and the assessment rate is lower because the actual value of your home increased. Y'all with me? I don't, don't, I'm not asking you to affirm that this is a good idea. I just want to make sure that I'm explaining it, right? So the percentage of your home that has assessed has gone down. But your property tax bill will not. If you lived in Bent, However, the property taxes on your home would go down because you're, you're just, well, assuming that it was an average price house, because they, don't, they didn't see the same growth in property value. Statewide, which is not the thing we're here to talk about, but I can't ignore it. Statewide, this creates a real problem. Because you've got small districts all across the state who have their property tax base to pay for their schools and their uh, fire departments and their emergency medical services and their recreation districts fall. Because the, the percentage of the value in their, pro in their uh, area that was being taxed went down. Right? For you guys, that assessment went down, but the rates still, the collections are still going to go up. No, it was 7.96. It went to 7.2. It went down. Can I okay. Just, can I just? I think the confusion is the word assessment. It's a, so assessed values have gone up. The assessment rate right. has come down. Yeah. So in that equation, that's where you're going. It still goes up. Next. Right. So assessed value. That is how much could you sell your house for? Arguably, if it sold for the same thing that houses that are similarly situated to yours would sell for, and you were putting it on the market today. That's the first part of that formula, the assessed value. What fell is the assessment rate. What percentage of your home is subject to taxation? If the value goes up and the assessment rate, even if the assessment rate comes down, your property tax bill, even there's, there's no change in mills, may actually go up. All right? This is the collections. These are show that had it been at 7.96%, your property taxes would have gone up much more. They fell because it dropped to 7.2%. All right. So on that formula, remember we talk about, um, oh, this is out of order. Well, anyway, we're going to do it. So we're going to get to, so I know it's not actually. So we're talking about upsetting the middle part of the formula, right? So we had your, I didn't talk a lot about how your houses are assessed, but we have the assessor here. She can talk about that. We were talking about the middle part. That's the assessment rate. That's the one that's set up statewide. It affects you differently. It affects everybody differently. Now we're talking about the third part of the formula, and that is the actual mill levy, the actual tax rate. How does that get established? 
Since 1992, with the passage of the Tabor Amendment, the, way, the only way you can increase a mill levy is through a vote of the folks that are in the district, qualified electors, all right? So for a special district, that's people who own property within the district. For the state of Colorado, it's all people who are technically, legally, appropriately registered to vote. If it's a city, it's within the boundary. The people who are technically, legally registered to vote in the city of County. Got you with me? Okay. Measures to put on a ballot, to be considered by whomever, um, are elect or can either be initiated by voters. So if you don't like something, you can initiate your own measure. I don't know exactly what the procedures are, but somebody in this room will know. For, for, the, for, a, for I can talk to you all day about the state measures. Uh, and, or it can be referred by the electeds. So the board of the, the, the district or um, uh, the board of the state would be the legislature, of course. For a more complete explanation of this whole special districts piece, because the Tabor Amendment, Article 10, Section 20 of the Constitution, sets up special rules for all different kinds of things. So if it's the state, or it's a school district, or it's a special district, there's little tweaks that are slightly different. And the Colorado Department of Local Affairs in their local government division has done this document called a brief review for prospective homeowners. I reviewed it, I thought it's complicated, but I thought it was a good document that might be helpful to you. All right, I'm going to now do something that will probably be, I don't know, it's probably going to piss somebody off in the room, but that's okay. That's kind of what we're here about, right? So I don't know that this is a good cross-section of homes and housing developments across the county. I don't know that much about Adams County. Sorry, I live in Denver County. Um, but I pulled, I, was, I, I just pulled some property tax assessments on some different houses in the community, all right? Because I think this is going to help understand a little bit what's going on. Most of the mills that are assessed on every piece of property in the state or in the county are the same, but there's a few things that are different. I happen to pull the ones that the, there's only one line that's different. So let's talk about what is. Now I'm going to I'm going to talk about this slide. I'll go to that in a minute. You're going to see different assessments because every it's housing development. Every, it's every uh, special district has its own financing requirements and needs and approaches. And there's, there's debt for capital improvements. There's ongoing operations debt. There's the financing structure itself, whether it's all on the property tax or whether it's on fees or whether it's a combination thereof. Um, and all the mill levies, of course, are taxes and they require the approval. And now let's go to what these mill levies are. These are the ones that are the same in all of the examples I give. So it's the library district, the city, the fire district, all of these are the same. So there's no difference in the, the rate, the tax rate on anybody's homes for any, of the, it, it, the, it, for any of these. If you live in Adams County, or at least the five homes I'm looking at, they're all the same. Here's where your difference shows up. It's on the mill levy for your special dis for the for the district in which you live, right? I don't know what to say about it. I'm not here to evaluate one way or another. Not. Well, I yeah. I mean, I I will tell you that this has been approved. These are legally approved differentials. Um, but that is the difference. And so I'm not here to talk. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I have other experts in the room to talk about this. But I just am here to tell you what the situation is, and that's what the situation is in terms of differences. And then again, for a more complete explanation of the school finance, uh, the special district finance rules, there you go. I put this question slide in here. I was wrong. We're going to hold questions until the end. I'm going to sit down. Thank you all for nobody falling asleep. So I'm going to hold I want to thank Carol for coming out. She's not from Adams County, but she gave a presentation to both the state, the House, the Senate, and also to Adams County. And we thought it was important if she has this type of information to come out and share it with you. Does anybody have any questions they need to turn in right now that they have done that they would like to turn in? If you could just hold those up and we'll come by and pick them up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just say something, you know, while we get ready. 
you know, I really appreciate you guys coming out here. I've lived in, in Buffalo Mesa for since 2005. I remember what this place was like when we didn't have a grocery store, we didn't have a gas station, we didn't have hardly anything. Um, I remember what it was like, and it's come a long way to get to where it is right now. And it will improve. Um, you know, maybe not, you know, when I wanted it to for my kids, but I'm not going anywhere. And I want to see this, this neighborhood and this community grow and thrive. And there's a lot of things on the horizon that are going to happen that are going to make that happen. So I appreciate all this interest. We just wanted to be able to come out here and share what we know with you because I, I don't know enough and that's why we bring these. And that's going to lead into me presenting Hatsi Melanakis, our elected uh, county assessor. very just pleased and honored to be here and I know that there's a lot of you in the room that are probably not very happy with me in my office and I just kind of want to say two things number one I am not the tax collector that gets to be Bridget Graham the treasurer but in her behalf and in her defense she really calculates your property tax based solely on the value she gets from our office and from the district mill levies so all Bridget does is the taxes, but she doesn't really, she's not in any way responsible for how they got there. Okay, um, I don't know if you want to know that, but I am a constitutional officer for the state of Colorado, County of Adams, and will serve a four-year term. Ooh, cool. Okay. I want to talk just a little bit quickly about what we do in the assessor's office. Number one, we are really responsible for four major functions that we do. We need to discover all of the property that's located in the county. We do that through new construction, property splits, combinations, personal property, on-site inspections, building permits, deeds, subdivision plats, GIS mapping, and my favorite, pictometry. Pictometry is a uh, it's an organization that they have planes and every two years they fly over the county and they take aerial photos of everything that's in the county and we do a lot of work based on those photos because we can't always get to places and they're very clear and distinct and we rely on GIS and uh, the photometry a lot for what we do. After we locate these properties, we classify them. We need to know if they're residential properties, commercial, it's agriculture. That really is hard to see, isn't it? I'm sorry. I know I see you squinting your eyes, and you know I'm squinting my eyes, and I know what it says. Um, anyways, we have to classify what that property is, and we put it in that class. After we have that arranged, then we oh that's better. Then we <laughs> list all that property in our database, and we go, which is back at the office. And the database that we use is a product called Realware. And we put all the information in there. Once it is in there, then we value your property. And I want to kind of talk about that just a little bit. We are like a mirror in the assessor's office. We simply mirror the market. The market creates the sales, and the sales create your value. If your neighbors at this time when everything was at such a peak and, and the properties were just, you know, there weren't a lot of them on the market. So when a house came on the market, people jumped on it. And then they wanted to pay premiums just to get the house. So just an example, if that house was $300,000 when they listed it, but someone came in and said, I have to have that house. I'll give you $325,000. I'll come in with twenty five dollars cash. And another person in a bidding war says, I'll give you 40000 extra for that home. What was a $300,000 house, if the $340,000 bid was accepted, it now becomes a $340,000 house because that was the sales price. And when we look at sales, we validate sales. They have to have, it has to be a valid arm length sale. So it's not like it's just a sale that we don't take into account quick claim, you know, the, sold it to your neighbor for a dollar or to one of your children or whatever like that. It has to be a valid sale. But that's what creates the market. And that's where 
in the market that we have today, because people were so wanting properties and they were not, the market was not, we didn't have a lot of properties on the market. And so people were selling them where they sold them at the premiums and that created the sales. And we have to base what we do on the sales. That's Colorado law. It is our goal in Adams County to assure public confidence in our accuracy, productivity, and fairness to provide just and equalized valuations for all real and personal property. We really want to be fair. We don't want to charge you or, or value your house or whatever it is any higher than what it needs to be because we know it does calculate into property taxes. Okay. Tax areas. Everybody lives in a tax area or basically, in other words, district. Tax area is a geographic region in which all properties are serviced by the same taxing entities. Properties located in the same tax area have the same mill, the same total mill levy. The total mill levy is the sum of the individual mills, <coughs> excuse me, mill levies for the area. And this is an example of one of the uh, mill levies in one of your districts right here in Reunion. I don't know who, if anyone of you live in that district. I just took all the districts that were in Reunion and kind of closed my eyes and pointed to one and this one came out. So it wasn't that I wanted to pick on this district or anything like that. It was just a random choice of, of just to give you an example. In this district is uh, District 561. We have Adams County that takes 27 mills, Commerce City 3.12, Commerce City North Infrastructure takes 27, the North Range Metro District takes 79.8, Rangeview Library District 3.6, RTD, they're really kind, they didn't, they're not charging you anything to ride the bus. School District 27J takes 49.3, Adams County Fire is 9.9, .9. South Adams Water and Sanitation to 3.1. The Urban Drainage and Flood is 0.5, and Urban Drainage South Platter is 0.061. The total mills, adding them all together, is 203.656. And that's, in that district, and how it is. And down here in the corner where we put the little box that has all of them listed on there, that exact same box you will find on your a property tax bill that you receive in January, up in the right or left-hand corner on the top is that little box. And in that box, it will it will give you your district number, and it will tell you exactly where you uh, who's taking what mills. So if you have a, if you keep your tax bills, which I assume most people do, if you go back and you look at it, you'll see your district, and you'll see exactly who is collecting your mills and who isn't, and if you're in a special district or if you're not. Now, I'm kind of going to be repeating what Carol said here, only I used a little bit closer to the, to the best. Calculations to determine property tax. Assessment value is the actual value of a property. Actual value is what we value your property at. Not the assessed value, but the actual value. So if we determine that your house is worth $337,000, that is your actual value. The actual value, to get your property taxes, you would take the actual value, I don't know if you guys want me to read all that, it's about the mill levy, taxes do, you kind of know that, but we'll just go with the example of how it's calculated. Mr. John's house and land are appraised at 337,000 actual value. And I need to list one, sorry. Actual value. It is then multiplied times the Colorado assessment rate. It was 7.96, and what we did is we used both of them to show you the difference in what your taxes would be from last year to this year with the drop in the assessment rate. At 7.96 times that actual value of 337, your uh, assessed value would have been $26,825. At the new rate of 7.2, it dropped it down about, what, $2,600? It's $24,264. You multiply your assessed value times your mill levy, which is the mill levy for the District 561 was 203656. So it's multiplied times 
202-656. Your taxes are $4,942. And that again was keeping with the Gallagher Amendment uh, and the, the level of commercial to residential. Special districts. I won't really talk a lot about special districts because this gentleman here is going to talk to you about that. I just uh, put that up there so that you would kind of, as a, because I really didn't realize how many of us were going to be talking about the same things. <laughs> so anyways, your special district though, districts are created to provide services to residents that they may desire as a result of not residing within a municipality or within a municipality which doesn't either provide, excuse me, provide a desired service or provide such service at the level desired. The bottom part is uh, when Carol talked about the, um, I'll go to the next slide, this uh, special brief, we pulled it up and I actually have one with me and we put on this, which is on the little pamphlet that I handed out, it has all this information on it and it's from the state of Colorado. It's a 10 page document and it really is, it is just I think reading for everyone because it really explains fully what a special district is and, and what you as, as a, a resident in that district, what, what you are entitled to, which is really just about everything, and where you can go to get the information that you need. The important thing with this slide is that in order to call the state to get financial information about your district and whatever, you have to give them your district number, which again was on that property tax uh, section that shows you where your district number is. If you don't want to go through all your records to find your property tax bills and stuff, please, our number is up there. Just call the assessor's office at the 720-523-6038. We will, it takes us literally seconds. We can look up your, by your address or by your name and we will give you your district number and you can take that district number then and call down to the state and they will give you whatever information you're, you're looking for. So it's a very, it's a, the booklet is just awesome. I mean, like I say, it, it, it covers absolutely everything that you might want to have any questions about a special district. So I re really highly recommend that you look at that and do that. And now that, before I go any further, I also want to kind of just really say about districts, because it was brought up to me when I was uh, visiting with some folks, we get a lot of calls that say, you know, well, my taxes are here, but my neighbor across the street and down the road a little bit, his are a lot less than mine are. Now, how is that happening and what are you doing? Districts, you could be in one district and across the street, the line was drawn and across the street is another district. And you will find that very, very few districts have the same mill levies. And what they are needing on that side of the street may not be needing what you are on this side of the street. And that makes the, dis you know, that makes the mill levies different, which makes your taxes different. Even if your house is identical, if your mill levy is at 203, and their mill levy is only at maybe 180 or 160, whatever it is, you can see the difference in the drop of what it would be. And the bad thing is, and not the bad thing, the good thing for, for sellers, but maybe not so much for buyers, that the values went up where they did, but the values are high, but the assessment rate did go down almost pretty close to 10%. So it is gonna offset it a little bit to kind of help you out. But it's really, you know, it's the market and the way the market is. Okay, we also put on my little pamphlet that we did, the special district's contact information that's within the reunion area. So it has the names and phone numbers of all the people that we think you can call to kind of find out about your, uh, your districts and whatever. So hopefully that, that information will be helpful for you. And it is on the, the little brochure that we brought. <clears throat> and this last one is just really, in so much as we would like to really be of assistance to all of you folks, I can't say enough that we have no jurisdiction or control over the districts. We simply do the values and then we base the values we get the certified mill levies from the, um, from the districts, and then we just do the calculations that way. So we, we really cannot, I mean, I have people call and they're very upset about the, the districts and the mill levies and whatever, and then so much as I would like to change it for everybody, 
I just can't do it. We have no jurisdiction legally to be able to provide that kind of service for you. So other than that, I think that's the end of my, did I say the end? Yeah. You're good. That's about the fastest. <laughs> I, I do, I do want to say one thing. My, one of my uh, residential supervisors is here. She lives in Reunion also, so she said she thought she wanted to come and kind of see what was going on as well. So, thank you, Cordova. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to gather any questions that may have been written out during that presentation. So I'm gathering all the questions that are All right, and at this time, I'd like to introduce our city representative, Michelle Alster. Hi, everybody. So I'm Michelle Halstead. I have worked for Congress City since 2011 in the city manager's office. Um, I was not one of those folks who raised my hands because I have not been here since 1982. I actually moved here 17 years ago. And uh, Commerce City uh, was very different in 2000, just like um, the state of Colorado was. So what I would like to talk to you a little bit about is how we get revenues and expenditures. But I want to kind of start with a little bit of context because where we're standing today was farmland 20 years ago. Um, Commerce City uh, has been one of the fastest growing cities um, in the state, but uh, in 2000 when I moved to Colorado, um, Commerce City had a population of 20,000 people. And most of that population was centered um, really south of 88th Avenue, which is kind of like in between where the R is <laughs> And that refuge right about there. Yep, thank you very much, Commissioner. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those. Um, so, uh, so it's it's definitely a, a city that's growing. And one of the, there's really three reasons that we've found why the city is growing. Um, as Carol Carol alluded to some of it, but the first is availability of land. So our current city footprint is that dark green color. It's about 36 square miles. But all those little dotted areas are where we're going to grow in the future. So the city has a lot of available land um, where people and businesses can come. The second is affordability. Um, I, I know that, that it might not seem that way, but Commerce City actually is, is pretty affordable when you think about the metro area. And a lot of people can rent or own homes in, in a way that makes some sense. So that is another reason why people are locating here. And we hear that from the resident surveys we do on a regular basis. And the third reason is accessibility. If you look where Commerce City is located, um, we have access to six major interstates or highways. We have two new commuter rail lines in close proximity, although one will be coming online hopefully soon. Um, we are adjacent to Denver International Airport, and if you think about where we're located in Metro Denver, you can really easily access northern employment, western employment, and southern employment as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, where we're standing it was farm fields, and most of the northern range, most of everything north of that uh, line that Commissioner Jasko pointed out, was um, agriculture. And I know that the railroads, uh, while they're a source of consternation, the railroads coming in actually started to evolve the city um, from a manufacturing side and industrial side, as well as getting agriculture goods to market. In the late 1990s, um, what we started to see was voters actually approving this idea of growing into this northern range. And so in the late 1990s, uh, voters agreed that we should expand our city boundaries, um, and we started to make those investments through um, improvement districts. The very first housing development north of 96th Avenue was built in 1999, and then other neighborhoods came on board. And so in 2016, we've gone from a population of 20,000 17 years ago to 54,869 and counting. So um, the city's total budget is 75.6 million for this 2017 calendar year. Um, 
About 4.2 million of that comes from some dedicated sources like lottery and open space um, and some drainage fees that are also restricted on how we use it. But I really want to focus on the $71 million that we get that goes to uh, the general fund, which is our primary operating fund, and it really funds those day-to-day -day operations. So that revenue um, comes from a variety of sources. The biggest is taxes, and we'll talk about that in a minute, because that's what we're here to chat about. Um, the other uh, chunk of money comes from charges for services. So if you take a swimming lesson, if you pay a recreation center membership or you do a drop-in, if you need plans reviewed by city officials, those are charges for services. Um, license and permits are about 2.5% of the revenue that the city receives. That comes from items like building permits, business licenses, excavation permits, if people are digging in the ground, and liquor licensing. We also get a fair amount of money from intergovernmental revenue. Those are monies that come from other governmental agencies. So um, that's about 2.5 million, so that would be grants from the federal government. That would be some ancillary taxes that get shared, like a cigarette tax. We get a very small portion, like other cities. Um, and then fines and forfeits are 1.3 million in revenue to the city. That is, uh, if you're speeding, sorry, um, or there's a code enforcement violation, those are what we call fines and forfeits. And then um, we have some miscellaneous revenue and some investment earnings that kind of come into play as well. But we're here to talk about taxes, right? So let's talk about taxes. All right, so sales and use tax. Um, prior to 2013, the city's sales tax rate actually looked very different. Um, and that's because voters in 2013 agreed to a 1% sales and use tax increase um, for parks, recreation, and road projects. So prior to 2013, uh, our combined current rate was 8.25. Um, the city's share of that was 3.5, and that total revenue picture of 74 million was more like 55 to 60 million. Um, so, you know, sales and use tax is paid both by businesses and consumers. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory if you go and you buy a, a garden rake at the Ace Hardware, you're paying um, a tax on that. Businesses pay a similar um, business to business transaction and that's essentially called use tax. Um, it represents 86% of our tax revenue. That's about $50 million. And sales and use tax is typically among municipalities the primary driver of how we get goods and services uh, provided. That's our primary source of revenue. Um, so our current rate is now 9.25. Four and a half goes uh, to the city. One percent of that is dedicated to the new parks, recreation, and road projects to not only construct them, but also to operate and maintain them. The state of Colorado takes 2.9 percent. The county takes 0.75. RTD, the Regional Transportation District, um, has a one percent uh, of that sales and use tax that funds not only their bus operations, but also the fast tracks expansion. And then the Scientific Cultural and Facilities District, basically your museums, all your cultural amenities. Um, voters recently um, approved keeping that and reauthorizing that. So that's one-tenth of one percent. And Commerce City does receive a portion of that back through our Commerce City Cultural Council through a granting process. Um, the current rate is 9.25. Within the state, local rates vary. Um, and, and these are all base rates. That doesn't include any type of special taxing districts that may overlay different fees um, or uh, uh, PIFs, um, public improvement fees that act like taxes when you make purchases. And we can talk more about that later if you'd like. From a property tax distribution, everyone's kind of talked about this. So um, this was also included in a handout, and if you didn't get it, um, it's on our website, but essentially um, Commerce City um, is one of many taxing entities. And because our city is so geographically diverse, we've provided you an example. If your house is worth $100,000, so times two or, you know, you'll have to do some math, but we like round 100,000 numbers. 
Um, if, you're, if you live in the Northern Range, just essentially north of 96th Avenue, you'll pay different, some different taxes compared to homes that are in the southern part of the city. Um, that's because we're served by two school districts. So your school districts you know, have different mill levy rates, as Carol and Patty have pointed out. Um, if you also live in the Northern Range, there's some additional um, taxing entities um, metro districts, but the city also has one as well, a general improvement district, and that's because um, this used to be grassland and we were investing in building this community. So from a property tax perspective, what that all means is that our current mill levy at the city is 3.28%. Um, that means we receive $22.52 uh, for every $100,000 of property value. Um, that translates into about $2.4 million. That's about 4% of our total revenue picture. Um, and for a point of kind of what does 2.4 million buy you, that about buys the trash and recycling service provided to every city, uh, every house in the city. Um, the Northern Range General Improvement District, Commerce City Northern Infrastructure, I think was how it was listed on, on the map. That is the district improvement district that was created about 20 years ago. First to construct the water and utilities improvements that are arteries of arterials for all of this future development. And it, it was eventually expanded and supported by voters to also include roadways like 104th and other transport, transportation <coughs> issues. So that's 27 mills. Um, and that property tax only applies to that geographic area. Again, there was, I think, and I'm sure Kelly or his team will talk about this, but you know, I think Colorado has a, a, a approach that if you know, you're going to build this type of development, those people who live in that area should pay for it. It's kind of like Stapleton, right? If you're in Denver, people who live in Stapleton pay a significantly higher tax rate because the rest of the city and county of Denver isn't paying for that new development. And so that's, that's just a, I guess, a policy discussion that, that can be had. Um, the Northern Infrastructure General Improvement District has a board of directors. It's the city council. So every year, the city council members, and we have Councilman McEldoni and Councilman Douglas in the room, approve a budget for the special district, and they look at whether or not the mill levy should be maintained or if it should be lowered. And that's a policy discussion. Currently, most of the assessed value that we get through this metro district is being paid on debt service. This district alone has about 5.2 million of annual debt that we have to pay for these infrastructure improvements that were built over the last few years. So um, in the future, um, if uh, the board would like, some of this money could be used to fund additional infrastructure needs or the mill levy could be reduced. The last chunk of taxes that the city gets are highway user uh, tax, and that's state motor vehicle tax. You might not know that no matter how high or how low gas tank prices go, uh, 22 cents of every gallon of gasoline goes to the state. And of that 22 cents per gallon, um, cities and counties get a proportional share. That hasn't been raised since 1992, um, and I think Carol alluded to why nothing has happened big picture wise from a tax perspective since 1992. But our share of that is about 1.7 million. And we have historically put that into street operations, but we have shifted this year, council's recommending that that money now goes into capital improvement projects to try to um, meet the growing needs of our city. So um, where do all those tax dollars go? We have to have a balanced budget. So if our budget is 75.6 million, we have to have expenditures that match. Um, $57 million goes to day-to-day -day operations. It takes about $57 million to operate the city on a daily basis. Um, we have a $10.6 million debt service payment annually um, that comes not only from uh, the 2K 1% uh, sales tax that we're doing, but also some of the other investments the city has made over the years. Um, and uh, 7.4 million is allocated to capital projects and some other things that we have um, dedicated revenue to. Tax dollars go to serve a variety of departments. These are operating costs. So from the police department to public works to parks and recreation um, to uh, community development, 
to maintaining the streets and the fleets, all of the, that 57 million goes to a wide variety of places. The other thing we have is we're required by law to also maintain funding reserves, um, and that's uh, a savings account, so to speak, so if and when we have another economic downturn, that we're able to pay the bills. We also take $14 million of that general fund, that's a new one million, and we transfer it to a variety of places, and this just kind of lists them. Uh, the budget of the glance handout that some of you have would have this information, and then also all of this information is available on our website. Um, as I mentioned earlier, voters approved in 2013 a 1% sales and use tax increase to go to new parks, recreation, road projects, not just to construct them, but to operate and maintain them. We have been able, thanks to you all in the room um, and others, uh, construct $144 million worth of public improvements that otherwise would not have been possible. If you think about it, our budget is $75 million. The brand new rec center, which is being um, built currently right now at Highway 2 and Chambers Road, is a $45 million structure. Um, and so Tower Road, which is being improved, which also includes significant utility and drainage and infrastructure underneath the roadway, because again, there's been nothing out there in the last 20 years, that project's about $41 million. So these are large scale public investments that we just simply have not had the resources but for voters um, trusting us and making those investments. So the good news is, is all of these five projects are supposed to be completed by January 1st, 2019. I can tell you they're all on schedule and within budget. The Tower Road uh, widening project will be complete by the end of the year. The um, new recreation center will open to the public this coming spring. We've already completed three new neighborhood parks in the northern area. We've opened a brand new outdoor leisure pool in the southern part of the city. Um, and we'll be starting renovations on the existing rec center um, later this month. In addition, um, we've built, we are also um, leveraging uh, general fund money to widen Highway 2. That project is being done in partnership with the state. Um, and that uh, will be done next spring. And then the Tower Pena on-ramp, because I know there's a lot of questions about that, so I'm just gonna bust that out, cross that one off the list. Um, we are going to be, we're bidding that project right now. Um, we will be um, opening those bids and awarding a contract in December, and we expect that on-ramp to open next year. In addition, we also, City Council also partnered with Denver, so we're widening and working with them to widen the portion from 81st underneath Pena, because you know, once we widen our section, it would stink to neck down and then have to uh, hear that. So that's what we're doing. Um, okay, there's lots of ways to engage and get this information. You have two city council members in the room um, who have emails and cell phones that are published, and we have lots of candidates who also will have that same accessibility. In addition, we host quarterly telephone town halls, and we do get some questions on a pretty regular basis about taxes. Um, and you can find more information and sign up for those on our website. Uh, we have a lot of public meetings and events. Um, the website's great, c3gov.com. It's mobile friendly. It's got a new search feature, so you could type in taxes, taxes too high. You could find lots of, of different um, resources as to why that information is there. And then we also are on social media, Facebook and Twitter. Um, and we mail a newsletter monthly to everybody called Commerce City Connected. It's like a newspaper print, um, and that has a lot of good information in it as well. So that's a little bit about the city. Are there any more questions that we need to gather up? Anybody? I think we've been doing it kind of all the way through. So at this time, I'd like to introduce one of my favorite people because he gave my, his, him and his organization gave my daughter an excellent um, education. And my daughter is very successful. My daughter graduated out of 27J. Um, I don't know if a lot of you remember, but when we were building schools, we were building schools like for a little while. And she was just moving around because there, were, there just wasn't enough space. 
And because of the growth, we're running into that. And that's why we're into this school now, this new elementary school. And it's because of the leadership, like Dr. Chris Field, that these schools are successful in improving the education for our kids. And my daughter, I, I thank God, is, is one of those success stories. And at this time, Dr. Chris Fielder, 27J. Doubling his technical support today, along with my friend Michael. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I am Chris Fiddler, Superintendent of Schools here at 27J. Um, first of all, I want to thank our presenters for coming out today and for your patience as we uh, got the building open and then uh, played with our wireless technology, which I should have been out here prepping for. Um, I want to share a little bit about the district, but let's do a little bit of audience participation for me. But how many of you, raise your hand and keep it up. How many of you have lived in your current home for a year or less? Three years or less? Five years or less? Keep them up. Seven years or less? Ten years or less? Okay. Good part of, good part of the room. Okay. Um, about ten years or more. Ten years or more? <laughs> <laughs> ten years or more. Fair enough. Um, so first things first, a couple, a couple of thank yous, um, and I'll preface it with this. So, Chaz reached out to me about holding a uh, meeting about taxes in our new elementary school here in Reunion, and imagine my delight, as <laughs> <laughs> we are on the ballot for 3 d as we speak, imagine my, my delight. Um, but a couple of thank yous. Uh, because of the voters in uh, 27 day schools, we stand in this beautiful building here, Reunion Elementary. We broke ground in this building about 14 months ago. It was, in, it was in August. We actually cut the ribbon for the building a year of the date that we broke ground. And at the time we broke ground, none of the homes to the north or to the immediate uh, west and east were there. So you think about this community is kind of growing around the school. It's really grown quite a bit. Uh, but this new school, we're about 75% of the way through the build on Riverdale Ridge High School, which is over 136 in Yosemite in uh, Thornton. Uh, we did great deal of work over the summer. Uh, if you know Brighton Court, Brighton between Bromley and Bridge Street, that entire section of 8th, uh, 8th Avenue there, every building we own got a new roof, um, several got renovations, and then we do have uh, two more new schools will be opening uh, in the fall of 2020. One is Roger Chris Middle School, which is on the west side of Riverdale Ridge over in Thornton, and then uh, Elementary 13, which is right at uh, basically 50th and uh, I-76 over there in Brighton. So thank you. Uh, my other thank you is, uh, my wife's really thrilled because she's seen me not very often. And when I, I told her yesterday, hey, did I mention I've got this tax thing I'm going to tomorrow? Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. Uh -huh. So then she's like, who's going to go listen to my taxes on a Saturday afternoon at 72 <laughs> degrees? I bet there's four people there. She was wrong by about 38. So thanks for being here. Um, just a little bit about the district. Um, very large district. We're 133 years old. Uh, you can see that the district consolidated in 1959, about 15 different rural districts. It became what we now call uh, School District 27J or 27J Schools. Um, some of those names you might recognize if we've named schools after them. Brantner Elementary comes to mind. Um, that big hole in the middle, of course, is DIA. A little L-shaped thing that we had a Long Branch School District down there. Uh, that's actually uh, our district, our, in our district as well. We don't have a school there. But we do have one of our. Uh, we do have a ch uh, charter school down there that is through the charter school institute. It's not one of ours. We have five charter schools in our district. Uh, 240-ish square miles with lots of room to grow, which you've heard a lot about. Uh, for a long time, we served students primarily in Core Brighton, um, and then. Through a series of bond elections, we built schools in the Northern Range of Commerce City. That's so how I came to the district. I was principal at Timmig Elementary School, which is about 120th in Peoria. Um, and our two of our newer schools over in the, the city of Thornton, which we refer to our, our West Planning area, it's actually Thornton's East area. But uh, Brantner and Westridge Elementary are there, and then we're putting in um, Rupert Elbridge High School. It's a very large area. You see the incorporated cities there, a lot of Adams County there. It's not incorporated yet, but much bigger than you think. Um, we talked about growth and the other panelists did. We count students every October. In October of 2000, we had about 5,400 students. Uh, we just went through our unofficial count this, this month, and we are uh, very near 17,500 kids. So we have tripled going on, quadrupling in size uh, here at 27J. Uh, second largest school district in Adams County and the 16th largest school district in the state. 
Uh, I mentioned this a little bit. We serve uh, really five different cities, three counties. Um, Twelve elementary, four middles, two comprehensive high schools, a uh, school, five charter high, or five charter schools. Excuse me. Uh, two of those, I think about that. Two of those are in Commerce City, uh, Brown, no, Bell Creek Charter, Landmark Academy, and the other three up are up in uh, Brighton. Uh, very diverse school district. So as Chaz mentioned, I was principal out of Prairie View when uh, his daughter was going through. Uh, very, very diverse school, Prairie View. Uh, bright, more traditional mm -hmm. in terms of their diversity. What's that timer doing to me? There we go. Uh, 49 different languages. You can see what our free English less percentage is for kids. Um, the homeless number always surprises people. That's not probably your typical definition of homeless. Those are kids who are displaced. They may be living with another family. Um, they live in an RV in a, in, a, in a campground that qualifies as well for homeless. All right, Billy. There we go. Um, Mythbusters, a little bit of Mythbusters. So um, you see there the growth that has happened in our in our district, right? So I get asked a lot as we're out here on the campaign trailing in for kids. Gosh, you guys ask every year. Well, we've grown a lot. We've been on the ballot quite often for schools. So that, that should make sense to you. So I think most of you know, and it's my chance to teach you yet again, bonds are for building and capital construction projects. That's all that can be used for. That's what the statute requires. Bond uh, elections only fund the building of schools and deferred maintenance. Uh, we were last successful in 2015, $248 million uh, for basically uh, four new schools and a whole boatload of deferred maintenance. We had 26 different projects going on this last summer, which I'm really proud of, but I'm also really sad that we had that many deferred maintenance projects that needed to be done in the school district. Um, I'll pick on Jazz. In 2014, we were out for a bond only, and he was a part of a group called the Quality Schools Initiative Committee that actually recommended in that year that we pursue a bond of $148 million and a mill-levy override the amount of $7.5 million. I knew this at the time. Jazz was less familiar with it, we've not had a great track record, record in passing military overrides. So he was in my office coming out of a capital facility fee meeting, remember this? Why did you ask for that bill? I mean, he was part of the group that recommended it to me, and I only recommended the bond to the board. Wow, why did you do that? You're going to be sorry you didn't recommend that bill. And I said, if we pass the bond election, I will not be sorry. Right, because we were on out on, out on the road talking about split schedules, talking about year-round calendar for elementary schools, and nobody likes that stuff, right? So we lost that election by 120 votes. Every other Adams County Metro District was on the ballot that same year for a bond and a mill levy and got crushed. Okay, so we were really close. Um, we came back the following year and were successful in the bond that helped build this school, as I mentioned before. Um, so mill levy overrides, a couple things that I want to take advantage of the audience today. So several folks showed you what the 27J mill levy is for the school district. It's about 49 mills, okay? 26 mills is what the state has set aside for most school districts, especially urban school districts. They, they set it at 26 and then the state backfills, which is comical. It was, it was funny when it was a little, you know, it made sense when it was a little bit. Now it's the majority fill, okay? So they set the mill for the general fund at 26 mills and then the state backfills the rest through income taxes. Right now, the state of Colorado pays about 72% of our general fund budget. You all pay about 28% as local property owners through your, out through your homes and through, through your vehicle taxes and under specific ownership taxes. But the state's backfilling now. So that's 26. 22 uh, mills is for a bond redemption. So the previous slide, all that debt we've accumulated over the years to build schools, we're paying uh, the principal premium interest on, that, on those bonds. We have had one successful mill levy for three quarters of a million dollars. To generate the money we need to uh, get that revenue, the mill is 0.755 mills. So it's less than one mill to generate that revenue. Okay. Just, why, why, are we, why are we always on the ballot? Because you know, everyone keeps saying no. So <laughs> that's why we're always on the ballot. It's just, it's just the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm always me. I'm a dad in the district too. Um, so, um, so just a comparison because I want you to I'll take advantage of the audience, give you some things to think about. Um, there are 15 Denver metro districts, 
it's in the My Comparison Group, it's the, it's the Colorado Department of Education's group. Um, so we, we fall in that group, and here are our competitors, and that's how I view them. Um, there are four metropolitan Adams County school districts, 27J, Adams 12, 14, Mapleton, and Westminster, and then of course we have other neighbors that aren't so far away. Just some big about. Um, on the left there you see uh, how the School Finance Act works. So there are a number of things that go into the School Finance Act. The biggest uh, ones that affect the, the uh, factors there when they're figuring how much each district should receive per student is um, average students. Uh, there's a size factor. If you're in a really small school district, that will cause that number to really jump. Uh, then there's a cost of living that indexes well. But as you see on the left there, coming from the state, we are 14 out of 15. Only Littleton receives less money than we do. And then on the right is the bill of the override per pupil. So the way I get to that number, and when you all understand that, I take whatever the dollar amount is that those local districts have approved through mill levy overrides and divide it by their October count. You can see that we're not only last, we're dead last, and it's a long way to 14th place. Um, the, the, uh, I'll get a little passionate and irritated. The inequity to me is offensive, right? So I get you all here to hear about taxes, and you're thinking, this is the wrong audience, Chris. And don't preach it to me, brother, because I'm not hearing it. The inequity to me as a dad and superintendent is offensive. It is a mess. It is an absolute mess. The next closest school district has 10 times the money per student, over 10 times the money per student, in the levy override. So I got a total funding, so we take the School Finance Act and then the mill levy as well. You see where we fall, not so surprised we're last. And then I've got that big delta there in terms of the difference. <coughs> It used to be about a $2,000 gap. It's nearly $3,000 in some districts. Inglewood, Denver, Boulder, um, and Edward. Put it off my soapbox. When you are last in funding, we're about 86% of our folks, or 86% of our budgets are our people. We're in people business. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you if you come in last in revenue that uh, we are making things work. Because like everyone sitting here, we have to balance our budget. We don't have the luxury of other, other I hate it, we get painted with that broad brush of government, right? We can't make it up as we go along. We have to balance the budget. Our board's done a really good job of that, but that's come at the expense of our people. Teachers, bus drivers, kitchen workers, custodians, all rank towards the bottom, or, or are at the bottom, in terms of how we're paying our folks. Um, 3D ballot language. The language that you see there, some of the language that confuses people, and they say, why do you write, people find that confusing. It sounds like a blank check. It doesn't make any sense. Is Tabor required? I don't write the language. I get with, I get with bond counsel, they tell me how to write the language so that we meet the Tabor law, and then it throws things in there that causes you all to go, wait a minute. I've been spending a lot of time, as you might imagine, on Nextdoor and Facebook. This sounds like a forever tax. It is. I think we should forever educate kids. Right? So my point is, 3D, because we're on the ballot, no one else is today. Lucky, lucky you guys. Um, of course, you got to go next. <laughs> uh, we chose not to put a sunset on this. Right, some districts go out and they run a mill levy and they sunset after five or ten years. Then they've got to go out and ask again to keep it. We're so far behind, we, we're going to put all our eggs in one basket and we get it done. But that ballot language that we get beat up on sometimes, that's required. That's the type required in the law. Right, so that language that sounds that confuses people, um, it's required. So a couple of things there that I want you to take away today is the question on the ballot uh, for you all to consider is a $12 million increase in mill levy override funds for the district. In year one, to generate that is 10.1 something mills. And the language says that in future years, not to exceed 12. For clarity, the Board of Education will have the opportunity to raise it to 12 if they choose. They can leave it at 10.1. They can do incremental things up to 12, but they can't exceed 12. <clears throat> that makes sense? See, that's not. Okay. All right. Um, another myth buster while I've got your attention. So depending upon where I'm at, if I'm in Brighton, oh my gosh, well this is 27J, you're half my tax bill. We are, because in parts of Brighton they pay 90 mills, which sounds really good to some of you. 
right? 90 mills total, so we're at 49. So at Brighton, we're, we're about half that tax bill. Out here, well, I can say, well, yeah, we're like 25% here, Bill, mm -hmm. right? Kelly's gonna talk about those special districts. <laughs> <laughs> right? And he'll, if, that's, a, that's a rhyme and a reason, it all makes sense. But in the end, those of you in this room are paying more of your special districts than you're paying to the school district. You know, if you caught that or not, we're at 49 mills. I think Carol had five different, or maybe it was Patty, had five different districts that she went there. Special districts. I did the same thing when I lived in Erie. Once upon a time, I lived in Vista Ridge. I gave more to the Vista Ridge Special Interest District than I did to Save Ray Valley Schools. And then, because I'm kind of a slow learner, but not really that slow, when I had to move to Brighton for this job, I went down to the planning department and I said, show me all the mill levy rates in the district. And there's, it's a list this long. Guess where I bought? Fort Brighton, already incorporated into the city. We're at about 98 mills, something like that. So we lose about half of my, or our bill. So anyway, that was probably more campaign than you had in mind, but I've got an audience yeah. that's more than four. And <laughs> <laughs> just those me a fear or something. <laughs> Done? I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. All right, so if you have more questions wrote out that we need to pick up, please hold them up. Rebecca and Sophia, Sophia will come around and pick them up. Um, again, like I explained earlier, when we get done here, we're going to do the questions. So please write your questions, get them in, get them turned in. We're going to try to give as much time as we can to answer all these questions. For the ones we don't answer, we're going to put them in a spreadsheet, we're going to give them to the experts, they're going to answer them, or we're going to put them back out and let you know where you can access them, okay? Next, I would like to introduce Kelly Lee, and I want to thank Kelly for the job that he is taking on, for him volunteering to come out here and explain what's happening. For those of you that remember, I moved in here in 2005, and if it wasn't for the special district, I wouldn't even live here. Because we are not, we did not have the infrastructure. And I know that that little portion of Commerce City that you saw before that used to be Commerce City was not going to pay for it. They weren't going to pay for somebody else's house in the North Range. So I'm very appreciative of what I have, where we're at. I may not like some of the formulas, but I love the area I live. And Kelly Lee, it's all yours. Great, thanks, sir. How we doing? Good. 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 Does everybody need to stand up for a second just to stretch? You okay? All right. Um, I'm going to be actually very brief, and, and you'll understand why here in a second. So again, Kelly Weed, I'm the Executive Vice President at Oakwood Homes uh, for Reunion. I am 21 days into this job. Um, I'm not a stranger to Oakwood Homes. I actually worked at Oakwood from 2002. Uh, to 2008, and the last four years at Oakwood, while I was there, I ran uh, an education foundation that uh, the founder of Oakwood Homes, Pat Hamill, started. Done a ton of work in Denver uh, and across the state uh, around early education. But uh, the last eight and a half years, I have been public service. The last, and most recently, with the city and county of Denver as an appointee of Mayor Michael B. Hancock. Uh, overseeing the redevelopment of the National Western Stock Show was my real, most recent job. I'm a third generation Colorado kid. Uh, I grew up on a small farm in Arvada when Arvada was still rural. Um, and I recently took my kiddos up to where our house was. Uh, the farmhouse was still there, but the farm was gone. Um, which uh, my, I had to pull over and my, I, I got a little emotional about it. And my daughter said, Dad, are you okay? And I said, No. The barn was gone, all the things that I knew about as a kid were gone. The house was still there, the dirt road was still there, but everything else had changed. And, and like the rest of the state, obviously we're growing people, I think, have finally discovered our secret. Uh, we're growing as a state. Um, and, um, and so, I, again, I'm just, I want to take this time, I'm here to listen to. Uh, Oakwood Homes is two months into the relationship at, uh, at Reunion. We, we acquired the master development rights from Shea, and one of the things you're going to learn very quickly about Oakwood is we're, we're long-term partners. Um, whether it's investment in schools, uh, I'm going to have my office out here uh, as part of my job. We're, we're looking at where that's going to be. Um, I invite all of you to attend. I think uh, we'll be sending something out here this next week. Uh, Kelly with Coffee or a uh, neighborhood appreciation event uh, that we're going to have on November 3rd, which is a Friday morning. 
uh, to get to know me and for me to get to know you, some face to face time. But you will see a lot of me uh, going forward. And I've had a chance just in the short time I've been here to meet some of the city council members. I got to meet with Chris. Chris, thank you for your service to our kids. Um, and uh, and I'm a long term friend. I've known Daphne for a long time. I've known Chad for a long time. So it's great to be here. What I'm going to do is, because we're still new to the community, I'm going to turn this over to, to our team, um, Kristen Baer, um, and uh, and then Sarah and Denise. These guys are experts at special districts. So both on the legal side of setting them up, you've heard a lot about the rules of engagements, about what special districts do. So now we're going to really focus on, on reunion, but give you some context um, uh, relative to reunion and, and other communities that are around us uh, and how those rate. I believe we do have a handout for you guys, but we'll also post the, the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen and Sarah to, to walk through the presentation. Thank you for being here. You guys got me on the swim here. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we'll turn it over. Thanks. A unique thing in Colorado. So special districts are political subdivisions of the state. They're formed under statute called Title 32. And I think in some of the other discussions, you've heard about other types of districts that are formed in Colorado. These districts are very unique in that they're formed on discrete areas in order that development can essentially pay its own way from the people or property owners that are benefiting from that development. Districts are organized in order to serve as financing vehicles. They really operate in order to serve and provide for the basic infrastructure that's necessary to get a development up and running, be it residential or commercial, and form them in, in the context of both of those types of developments. There are over 1,500 Title 32 metropolitan districts in the state of Colorado. And when I talk about Title 32, again, this is a unique district that is authorized to provide infrastructure to developments. The financing vehicle is utilized in order to issue bonds essentially so these districts issue bonds and then those revenues are used to develop the infrastructure and when i say infrastructure i'm talking about the pretty stuff you see above the ground so like the reunion rec center uh, some of the landscaping the parks that you have in reunion i'm also talking about the stuff you can't necessarily see so there are street improvements there are sanitary sewer improvements there are water improvements uh, there are storm drainage improvements that are all necessary in order to get a development up and running. These are all types of things districts uh, finance. And as governmental entities, they are afforded authorization under statute, so under the specific statutory reference, as well as under a document called a service plan, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So this is a map that has been prepared by the Division of Local Government, which again is a division of the state that handles local government entities. There's been a lot of discussion about growth in the Northern Corridor. And you can see that the number of districts in the Northern Corridor is pretty extensive. Um, you know, in Larimer we have 106. In Adams County we have 226 metro districts. Uh, districts are used commonly now as new property is developed. New residential developments go in. It is very rare that these developments go in without a district. That's because cities and counties can no longer fund the type of infrastructure that's necessary to get these developments up and running. So again, we have this unique infrastructure or these unique districts that are enabled in order to finance and construct the infrastructure. This next graph shows the growth in districts, these are Title 32 districts, from 1997 to 2016. So you see we went from 913 districts in 1997 to 2,227 in 2016. The good news is that in Colorado, the economy is rising and we're doing great, okay? That is indicative of the amount of development we have here. Again, indicative from the population growth we have and will continue to experience. So HOAs are a little bit different than Title 32 districts. Title 32 districts are actually political subdivisions of the state of Colorado. So they are governmental entities. 
An HOA is usually established under nonprofit um, corporate authorization pursuant to statute. So they're subject to the laws that are established for purposes of corporations, and they're subject largely to the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act. They can limit the use of facilities because they're a private entity, so they don't have the types of restrictions that we see with governmental entities. And they're typically responsible for covenant enforcement or architectural control. Districts, again, are these quasi-municipal corporations and political subdivisions. So they're subject to, specifically, Title 32. As a governmental entity, they are subject to all of the types of political and governmental restrictions that you see for counties and for cities. So they're subject to open records law. They're subject to public meeting requirements. Uh, they also operate as a form of local government because they finance facilities with public revenues through property taxes, their facilities have to be open to the public, okay? How do you know if you're in a special district? So when you buy property in the state of Colorado, the first thing that happens is you sign a contract for purposes of purchasing a piece of property. That contract is required to have a disclosure in it that says you may be in a special district and here are things that you can do in order to um, confirm with the assessor's office or the treasurer's office relative to your property taxes and whether you're in that special district. That's the first thing. Title companies also provide you, as you're going through the closing process, they provide you with a title commitment. That title commitment has a number of different things on it but it has what's called an exceptions. And when you look at the exceptions, you'll see all sorts of recorded documents. Those are the things that encumber your property that you're, that you're gonna purchase. One of those encumbrances that you're gonna look for is an order. And if there is an order stating that a special district has been formed on your property, that means the property that you're purchasing is within the boundaries of the special district. Which you ought to notice that you need to do a little due diligence relative to the property taxes. Now, the, the uh, title company will also provide you a certificate of property taxes. That's largely the information that we went over previously, but it'll show you all of the taxing entities that that property is within, as well as the current mill levies or property taxes that are being assessed by each of those entities. Okay? We also, um, I'll talk about the service plan in just a minute. Also, as we are going through the process of organizing districts, some of those governmental jurisdictions may require special districts to have to record a notice on the property that would also show up in the exceptions, and that would just say, you're in the boundaries of this special district, here's what the general authorization of that district is. That's pretty specific to the governmental jurisdictions that we're dealing with. So Title 32 statutory powers. When we hear about, or, or talk about the term metropolitan district, that just means it's a Title 32 district with two of these powers up here. These are all the types of things that a district can do and engage in. All of the facilities it can construct, all of the facilities it could potentially operate and maintain. Okay? When we go out and form these districts as financing vehicles, they construct these types of facilities. Sometimes those facilities are owned, operated, and maintained by the district. Largely, some of those facilities are conveyed to counties or cities for perpetual operation and maintenance. The majority of the facilities that involve streets, sanitary, sewer, uh, or water improvements, those are largely conveyed to governing jurisdictions. Districts normally, uh, and there are some exceptions to this, but districts normally engage in the operation and maintenance of landscaping, parks, and other types of amenities, sometimes drainage facilities as well. Districts have also recently been authorized to engage in what we would otherwise consider to be HOA activities, so they can engage in covenant control and architectural types of, of controls as well. Okay, so the service plan, you heard me refer to that, that is a governing document that is put in place for purposes of authorizing the district. So Title 32 gives very broad authorization 
The service plan is what we would see for purposes of a private company, articles of incorporation or bylaws. It can constrain the district's authorization. We normally see service plan constrain authorization in terms of what a district can do financially. So the amount of bonds it can issue, the mill levies or property taxes it can assess, and the duration in which it can assess those property taxes. The service plan also contains information about the types of facilities a district can construct and finance and or operate and maintain. So again, it's the governing document for the district. It sets forth all of these authorizations. We go through a process when we're organizing a district uh, relative to negotiating a service plan for the district that are proposed with the governing jurisdiction. So in the case of reunion, for instance, this service plan went through, it was negotiated with the underlying um, governing jurisdiction, it goes to a public hearing before the council, it is approved, disapproved, or conditionally approved. Once that document is actually approved, we go to district court and request the court to allow us to hold an, oh, an organizational election. And that election really has three primary components. It's for the organization of the district, it's for the election of the initial board of directors, and it's to authorize debt and taxes as are permitted under that service plan. So at that organizational election, assuming that those questions pass, the district obtains an order for organization through the district court. It's recorded on the property, and again, this is the document that will show up on title work. And at that point, the district is legally organized. Okay, again, District Board is a governmental entity. They're publicly accountable. So all meetings that the District Board has are open to the public. They have to maintain minutes as well as records of all agreements, resolutions, or any other thing that the District Board adopts at a public meeting. Those are all available for public inspection as they are public records of the district. They have to hold elections. So the Board of Directors are elected uh, in May of every even numbered year. So the next regular election is in May 2018 for the boards. They have to adopt annual budgets and they have, are subject to independent audit as well. And Sarah can talk a little bit more about that process. Normally what we do in the process for adopting a budget is towards the end of the year. We look at all of the expenditures and again, because the district's a governmental entity, we have to have a balanced budget. Look at all of the expenditures and the revenues that are going to be necessary to serve those expenditures. The mill levy of the districts are required to be certified to the county not later than December 15th. So the process largely starts in October and ends in December 15th as we certify that mill levy. So financial authors, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. How many of you know whether or not you're in North Range 1 or North Range 2? And my guess is that the majority of you are probably in North Range 1. So if you look at your tax bill, you may think you live in Reunion, right? But Reunion does not show up on your tax bill because you live in a North Range district. So the community is actually set up into a multi-district structure that allows them to operate financially. So there's the North Range 1 district, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The first phase of development was North Range number one. We're getting into North Range two. That's a lot of what you see the new construction going in under. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was kind of familiar that we've got a couple districts that we're operating under. Reunion is the main overall district that handles the day-to-day -day operations that um, takes place within your community. So the financial powers are derived from and limited by sources. So Kristen mentioned you know, your state statutes. We go through the process of approving a service plan and then the electorate, which was the election that gives certain authorizations in regards to taxes and fees, rates, tolls, penalties, general obligation bonds. And general obligation bond means that your bonds are repaid from property taxes. Then there's also a revenue bond if you have a fee or a charge that you want to um, impose in order to pay those bonds. That's another mechanism that you can use to finance improvements. And typically, these bonds are set up so that the cost of financing these improvements are paid back over a long period of time, say 30 years is kind of the norm. Sometimes it can get into 40 years. 
And the reason that you do that is so that there's a longer period of time to pay back the cost for the improvements. I mean, I don't think there's very many people that believe they'll be in the community for 30 years plus. So the majority, maybe it's seven, eight years, and you'll turn over and, and move. And so the thought there is, let's spread out the cost of the improvements over phases of people that live in the community. And so that's typically why you see a 30-year general obligation or a property tax bond in your community to pay for things like streets, the sewer improvements, the water improvements, and so forth. So the revenue in reunion, we have the property taxes. We also have development fees. There is a fee that's imposed to builders when they go to pull a building permit so that they contribute funds to the cost of the improvements. We also receive specific ownership taxes, and this is essentially free money in the sense that the district doesn't have to do anything other than levy property taxes to collect this revenue. So this is when you, you go to pay your annual registration, you get your, your note card, and it says you're paying such and such to license your vehicle. There's a portion on there that's specific ownership taxes, and those are collected and given to the counties to distribute for all the taxing entities within um, the county. And so typically, reunion averages about 8 to 10 percent of the property taxes it levies. It also receives in those specific ownership taxes. There's also revenue sharing. We have partnerships with the city of Commerce City to receive a share of sales tax and impact fees, and there's other things associated with that agreement to help offset the cost of the improvements as well. So we've talked about this a couple times in the various presentations, and we were going to illustrate the 7.2% assessment ratio, what that means on a $100,000 house, and so it's that same story that we've seen a couple times here. But I think where I want to show you some information relative to how does that translate to you as a homeowner. And I think that what's important is if you look at other special districts, some of these are your neighbors and some of these are located, let's say, in Aurora. And the reason we chose Aurora is because it has that access to E-470, right? You've got the good commuter access, access to the airport. So it gives you a sense overall where, if you look at the total right-hand column, the combined fees and district tax, if your home was valued market value at 400000 that translates into assessed value of 28800 so you levy your mills on that value and you come up with your district tax amount. And then there's also another component of living in a community, right? You have HOA fees. And I think that really tells the story when you combine those two of what it does cost to live in a community. You can't really isolate one without the other to get a total picture of what is direct, directly affecting you in terms of community costs. So you can see reunion. I've noted um, that the districts are Northridge 1 and 2. Right now that's where the homes are within the reunion community. And you can see we've added um, community names and metro district names as well for the other ones because sometimes the names don't necessarily match up with the districts if you're trying to do some research and see what some comparable melodies are. That gives you some information. And this is available on the table for you all to take. But you can see um, reunion. Not the highest, not the lowest. And what's also important when you look at something like this is you have to look at the amenities that your community provides and the services that you receive <coughs> from your district. Because I can tell you, not every district listed here has a rec center, has the programs that you all have. And so it's, it's really a balance of understanding what you all get by living in a community. So what do your reunion taxes pay for? So obviously there's the administrative cost of the district. This pays for you know, the general compliance that the districts have to stay in um, statutory compliance. You have the operations and maintenance costs, so the parks and the district landscaping. Reunion owns their parks and all the landscaping that you see around the community. Now some of those um, districts down in Aurora, the city of Aurora will take on the maintenance and operations of those parks, but that's not the case with Reunion. They're responsible for the water costs, irrigation repairs, replacing mulch, things like that. The Reunion district is paying for such things. You also have the rec center and the operations and maintenance and the improvements that we have to provide to that facility. 
And not only that, but the, the ball fields, the parks, where all the programs, the soccer programs, and things like that are taking place, the district takes care, takes care of those costs as well, too. The bond payments for financing the capital improvements. So this is the streets, the water, the sewer, the stuff above the ground and below the ground that we are paying off with our general obligation bonds. So we have property tax bonds and not the fee revenue bonds. We also take care of covenant control and architectural review. So reunion um, does administer the HOA type functions within the district, so you don't necessarily have a separate organization acting as your HOA. It is combined. And then community activities, the trunk retreat, blues fest, all those things that um, Steve, have you all had a chance to meet Steve over at the rec center? He's the one who coordinates all the community activities. He does an awesome job. And then also um, Raul and Matt Darby, they office out of the rec center as well too. You know, they really do a great job with all the community activities and bringing everyone together. Uh, you know, every once in a while, it's good. Um, so with that in mind, the website, reunionmetro.org. If you haven't gone to the, the website, please take a moment and go there. There's a lot of resources there. There should um, also be a financial section. So any of the audit reports that we do have um, performed by an independent aud auditor. They're listed there. Budgets. Just general contact information that's all included. And then the Division of Local Government website, we talked about that, as well as the Special District Association that's obviously specific to districts. So there's some very um, helpful information as well on that site. All right. All agreed that they will look at the questions that are remaining and answer them, and I will post them in the Facebook group. I'll also post them on my own Facebook page in case anyone's not in the reunion Facebook group. So first question, who sets the assessment rate? Go ahead. The legislature sets the assessment rate based upon the gathering of the relative values from all of the assessor's offices. And then they are, are charged with, the, the, there is a board of assessment that makes a recommendation, uh, but, but the actual uh, percentage itself must be adopted by the legislature. I will say, just to add a little bit of information to this, remember how I talked about Gallagher, you have to stay at that 45, 55, and they, they, assess, they set the assessment rate to make sure that that's how many taxes are generated from each uh, from residential versus non-residential. There have been multiple times since 1992 when the assessment rate for homes should have actually increased in order to keep the assessment rate where it was. But because of the, 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 another constitutional amendment we've talked about a lot, the Tabor Amendment, the, ele the legislature doesn't have the authority to increase the assessment rate without a vote of the people. And so in a year where it was supposed to go up, in all instances, the legislature has kept it where it was the prior year, rather than sending that increase to the voters for approval. And I think it's been, I don't know if it's 13 times since 1982, 14 times since 1982, that the assessment rate has been lowered by the legislature. Thank you. Uh, school District 3D question. We want our taxes to support public schools. Why are funds di diverted or assigned to charter schools? Oh, another myth buster. Charter schools are public schools, right? So um, we have five charter partners. They all have their own board of directors, which means that um, our board doesn't oversee them. They have a contractual relationship with charter schools to provide educational services to our kids. But they are public schools. Um, and then the, the flow through occurs where the district receives the money and then we flow through the state funding on a per pupil basis along with the $43 per student from our one successful mill levy override, that money flows to those kids who are enrolled as well. Um, but the relationship is contractual. They have, they have a charter and uh, their board of directors and our school board of education are in a contract together. Um, so yeah, they're, they're public school. That's the answer to that question. Okay, uh, don't sit down. <laughs> um, and there Thanks, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> there are three questions on this sheet, so I'll, if you don't mind. Okay, school mill levy. What will the initial mill levy be to raise the $12 million? 
10.1 and change. I don't have all the numbers okay, after the Okay, we're going to say 10.1. Okay. After the initial mill levy increase, can it be raised another 12 over that? For example, if the initial mill is 8, can it go up another 12 to 20? Or is it capped at 12 so it only goes up to 4? It is capped at 12. So the initial um, mill levy to raise the $12 million will be 10.1 and some change. But the board, if it passes, the board will give authority to the board to raise it not higher than 12 additional mills. Okay? So over time, as, as the assessed valuation of the district grows, it will generate additional revenue. Which is why the gap between 27J and other school districts keeps getting wider because they have done similar things. The mill levy that it passed in 2000 for $750,000 was a fixed dollar amount. So the mill levy to raise that $750,000 has fallen year after year after year after year. I think it was two and a half, maybe three mills when it passed. And like I said, it's, it's less than one mill, less than three quarters of a mill actually. And finally, has the increase in assessed values of homes? taken into consideration in raising 12 million. I'm guessing that was the increase in assessed values of homes taken into consideration in raising 12 million. So let me get my head around that. So as the assessed value goes up, it's going to cost, if the mill levy is less than we thought it was going to be, we, uh, prior to the assessment coming out for this, this last go around, we thought the, the assessed value of the district was going to be around a billion dollars, which makes the math really easy. So we thought it was going to be 12 mills to generate 12 million. Uh, our assessed valuation came in at 1.17 billion and change, and to get to that 12 million dollars in year one is 10.1 mills. So that was, that was factored in. But no, no, another one of the myths, right? So the AV has gone up, so surely you're all swimming in money down at the school district. No. No, the state has set the general fund mill levy at 26 mills, right? And as the AV goes up, local money is paying more of the share for, for our general fund revenue, but the state reduces the amount that they backfill. So it has, it has no impact on us whatsoever, nor does it have any impact on the current mill levy override. That number has just gone down as the AV has gone up. It could affect the bond redemption fund in terms of driving that mill levy down. Um, but we do not have more additional general fund money because the AB has gone up in the district. And that may have been the real question. Excellent. Uh, or thank you. Um, okay, you make sense. <laughs> um, why are the sales taxes so high? I have bought two cars in 10 years, and when they estimate the sales tax and then set to the actual tax rate, and the dealership is shocked at how high it is, Michelle. And so, then your next question. Oh, thank you. Um, so, uh, sales tax rate is 9.25, and that additional 1% was voter approved in 2013. I know that when city council members thought about how to raise more revenue relative to uh, the infrastructure needs, most of the sales and use taxes that are paid within the city um, are really coming from business to business transactions. Um, but yeah, car car taxes are are you know that's a huge purchase, and so there is a huge chunk. But it's 9.25 primarily. Chad, you want to add to that? I just want to add something. I sit on the board for E470. And I know on your, your bill every year, I think I had a conversation earlier, that there is a, a, a VRF fee, it's a vehicle registration fee. That fee is limited to certain counties. That fee will basically sunset in 2018. So the board of E470 is going to decide whether to continue that fee or to actually get rid of that fee. Um, I will tell you that we have already gotten rid of one fee and that's the highway expansion fee. We have deleted that as a board, and I think the general direction, I want to say that our council member Steve Douglas also sits on the E470 board with me. Our general direction is to take a look at that vehicle registration fee, which is $10 a year, and hopefully sunset that in 2018. Excellent. Um, this, may, this may be a multiple person answer. <laughs> um, why are our property taxes so high? You can pay much higher in reunion than nearby areas in Commerce City. Also, our rates are three, four, five times higher than other communities in Colorado where houses are growing. Yeah, that, that's probably kind a of a Taco Metro goal. District question. So maybe Team Metro District wants to take that. <laughs> 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 so, 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 yeah. Team Metro District, come on. Metro <laughs> district. Okay, so again, 
Um, districts are formed on new developments. Just like cities have different property taxes, counties have different property taxes, these metro districts across the metro area are formed with authorization to impose different property taxes. So again, you see this long list of taxing entities that are applicable to any given property. It's going to be different based on where you live. Um, you could be paying more in a new development like Stapleton than you are in Reunion. It's going to be different because you have different layers of property taxes that you're paying just based on where you live. Um, yeah, I would just say the city's property, the city gets essentially two property taxes, right? It's that original Commerce City, three point whatever mills, the $22.52. And then it's the Northern Infrastructure Improvement, General Improvement District, which again, helped fund all of the base infrastructure and was formed in the late 90s, early 2000s. Late 90s, early 2000s, the Metro District was formed. Is that the general improvement. The general, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, an additional Metro District question. Oh, can, I, can I ask? Yes. I can just, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jason. Thinking back to two. Councilman. One of the things to keep in mind, you hear about the Metro District being used to generate revenue to invest in the original infrastructure for a union. And we hear a similar definition when we hear about the Northern Infrastructure GID used to invest in infrastructure. If you draw a little line around reunion, right, Metro District dollars went into building the infrastructure inside the reunion boundary. The North, uh, the NIGID or the North Range uh, GID was used to build the common infrastructure, sewer, uh, wastewater, stormwater, et cetera, outside the boundaries of reunion and each of the other special districts. So yeah, it essentially goes from like 85 Highway 2-ish, um, all the way across to Tower Road, and then really north, uh, anything north of 96th Avenue, all the way up to our border at 120th. So that's what the NIGID pays for. Dad? I'd love to add to this conversation a little bit more, a, a little context as well. Not every state in, in the country does development fees and expenses this way. When voters approved the Tabor Amendment into the Constitution in 1992, we opted for government that says you only get it if you pay for it. Prior to, and in the way it works in most communities across the country, if you build a new space, if, if there's a part of an unincorporated county where you want to put in um, new roads or a new housing development, in many cases, the question is asked of all county voters, to put in those, the, what you said, underground and above ground developments, uh, particularly the underground. Some of the above ground tend to be HOAs and that's a little different. But in Colorado, the, the theory behind the Tabor Amendment is that you shouldn't be paying for something that somebody else gets and they shouldn't be helping you pay for what you get. Now many people think that sounds really equitable and wonderful, but it also creates a lot of complications because what that means is as you are literally, if you're within a district, you're paying for all of those development costs that in most states would be shared among all voters in, a, in the broader uh, political district. And so what that means is it's, the, the fees are more concentrated because it's based on the you get what you pay for model of government and that is very unique to Colorado. Well and this question sort of follows up on that. You just might as well just stay right there. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Um, is the metro district bound by Tabor in order to create increase its mill levy? So when the districts are organized, what normally happens is they have that organizational vote. At that organizational vote they initiate an election for the initial debt and taxing authorization. That debt authorization under Tabor for districts lasts for a 20-year period. At that point, it expires, and to the extent that the district needs to issue new debt, it would have to bring a new election forward. So it is subject to taxing increases based on Tabor authorization, but that election authorization is obtained at the organizational point in time. Okay, um, we're still so talking here. Yeah, keep standing. Um, <laughs> why do we pay to two different districts for infrastructure? Are we being double taxed? And and this question has 
uh, one, Commerce City North Infrastructure, two, North Range Metro District number one. Okay, and, and I think that was largely answered, but the, the if, boundaries, do, no, go ahead. That, so the boundaries of the GID are a little bit different than the boundaries of the district. So again, the district boundaries are intended to be a discrete district that finances infrastructure for the development itself. The GID is a little larger and encompasses a broader land base or property owner base in order to pay for improvements that benefit a larger uh, area. That's correct. So that's thank you. Uh, when will the Commerce City bond be paid off for infrastructure? Okay, so the Northern Infrastructure General Improvement District, I think, had a 20 to 30 year bond. I'm looking at the council numbers. It, it was extended in 2007 when the voters voted. That's for right. Standard. So it, it, it's a long time. Um, <laughs> I can double check and find the actual absolute date. So the General Improvement District is, is a longer period of time. And City Council annually every year decides whether or not the mill levy is sufficient to pay the debt. And, and that's really what is the guiding principle because we have to pay the debt. In terms of the 2K bonds, we issued our first series in 2014, our second series in 2011, or 2016, and those are about 20, no, those are 30 year bonds. So we have another 30 years. <laughs> okay, at some point the infrastructure will get built. What is the projection that the North Metro District mill levy will go down? We're projecting a 50% population growth by 2050. Why doesn't that lower the special district mill levy? I think that's good for us. <laughs> Do you want to answer that, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Relative to- Yeah, I'm going to read it again. At some point, the infrastructure will get built. What is the projection that the North Metro District mill levy will go down? And based on projection of a 50% population growth, why doesn't that lower the special district mill levy? Okay, so the mill levy will go down when all of the debt is paid off, right? And that's not, and you have a pledge on your bonds, and it's a specific mill levy pledge that even if your property taxes go up and down, you have a mill levy pledge, and so that will hold the mill levy at a certain rate to pay off those bonds. And so if you do have more revenue come in, then there may be uh, opportunities to pay it off earlier. So additional revenues definitely help, which are projected and required contractually in the bond documents to keep a mill levy consistent through the repayment term of the bonds. I'll add to that. Um, I like to tell people to think about it a little bit like the mortgage for your house. I mean, when you enter into a mortgage for your home, you're, most people enter into a 30-year fixed mortgage, so you're not thinking, well, I'm going to pay that off in the next five years. It's the same way with the infrastructure. It's very difficult to pay off such a large amount of infrastructure cost at a very short period of time. So we do very similar things as to what you do when you buy a house. We're amortizing the cost of that infrastructure over a period of time to make the payment terms uh, palatable and doable for the people who are paying it. And you were not in the room when Kelly introduced you, can you? I'm Denise Denslow. I work uh, for the Reunion Metro District as a consultant, as the district manager. I've worked on Reunion here and there and everywhere since 2009, probably. So. Thank you. Uh, I just want to Council piggyback on the, the analogy of the mortgage, because I think this is a really good <laughs> analogy. Um, there are questions oftentimes, and I've seen some recently in social media about refinancing and decreasing the mill levy, et cetera. And so one of the things to know, and I'll speak in this context to uh, Commerce City and our uh, Northern GID, we've had an opportunity to reconsider the amount of the mill levy. We've refinanced that. We've had other series of debt where we have uh, made the decision when we've had quote unquote surplus revenue to pay down debt earlier, which just like if you pay off your credit card earlier or you pay off your home earlier, it helps to save money over time. So there is an annual effort to look at the entirety of the financial picture. And so again, just saying from the city's perspective, we have to obviously preserve that, that rate. Um, I think the, the home mortgage analogy makes great sense also in terms of how much can you go spend, right? This is the same thing with Chris and his, his um, district examples is, how much can I collect? How much can I then guarantee in terms of annual payment, repayment of that debt? So 
the things you're familiar with from a credit card or your home mortgage are really applicable in this context with subtly different names, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there a property tax reduction at age 65? If so, what percent? Okay. Okay. We have uh, what they call a senior exemption. In the senior exemption, you have to be 65 on January 1. And so if you want to get it for the year 2017, you really have to turn 65 in 2016. And you now have, you have to live in your home as a primary residence for at least a minimum of 10 years. And that's kind of a harsh restriction, but it's there. And, I, and I've been told that the legislature is working on it to where they would like to at least allow seniors to be 65 and maybe take that exemption one time to like downsize or to do things that would help them, you know, further be able to live and stay at home. That is correct. The legislature has been working on that. Yeah. But they, yes, if you get up to $200,000, so if your house is 200000 or less, you get a, a hundred or 50% off. So if it's 200, it's 100,000. If it's 201 and over, you get a 100,000 exemption flat. So whether it's 200,000 or 2 million, you're gonna get $100,000 off of your value. And that's off of your actual value. So it's off the actual value. And then, so if you had a $200,000 house, it's gonna be 100,000. And then that 100,000 is assessed at the assessment rate of the 7.2. Thank you. So it's a big reduction in, in health with taxes. Was there a cost passed to homeowners in reunion that the builder normally pays changing our homeowners tax? I think what that question is maybe asking is how does the, the district tax affect your cost as a homeowner? Um, over the years I've talked to a lot of homeowners about metro districts and how they work and I like to describe it to people as there's a fixed cost to building a community and whether or not you're paying it to uh, your metro district you're paying it to a city or a county there's a sunk cost to building roads water lines sewer lines parks and open space and things like that um, we, the metro district is financing the infrastructure and the benefit to you as a homeowner is that um, those property taxes are tax deductible versus just uh, paying a fee or a fine, not a fine, a fee, uh, um, back to the developer for infrastructure that they have paid for. So it is really to your benefit to use that vehicle versus just paying a fee outside of a quasi-governmental mm -hmm. entity. Okay. Deborah, your voice really carries, which is very much appreciated. But there's no microphone, and it yes. would be helpful if people, okay. try, everybody tries to speak up for the entire audience. We'll do that. Were you able to capture that answer? That's all right. Okay. Um, so, Michelle, $57 million to run a city, question mark. Um, what is the breakdown? Um, uh, who who determines the needs for headcount ex expenditures, et cetera, business, um, uh, sales, sat, all of this. This doesn't, I, I can't. I'm trying to read the handwriting, I apologize, but I, I, I hope I got the gist of the question now. So, we're 57 million around the city, true. Um, we have this great, I know this looks really big, but it's it's actually really easy to read. It's uh, our budget book, so every year um, we pass a budget. How do priorities get set? It's set by city council members. So city council members um, really provide policy direction. So every year city council identifies what their key priorities are and goals and objectives. The city manager, um, who is one of three employees the city council hires, um, tells the rest of the employees um, what that direction is and is responsible for making sure it gets implemented. So we have some base level services like um, uh, response times. How quickly does an officer get to your house? And council members look at that and is that number acceptable or do we want to change it? And if we want to change it, how many more officers do we need? And if an officer fully loaded costs about $100,000 or more per officer to outfit them, um, well then, what else are we not going to fund? And those are really the types of trade-off conversations that City Council has. And that process starts in the beginning of the year, in January. Um, we present as staff a draft um, 
work plan every year that says here's how we think we can accomplish your goals um, in the middle of the year and then we really formally start the budget process by identifying potential FTEs and really from May until August uh, city council members work to whittle down those priorities and have that trade-off conversation so that's just you know <coughs> recreation hours um, uh, you know, fees are assessed annually. How many public safety officers? How long do you think you should wait for a building permit to be obtained? How many code enforcement officers should we have? Um, and, and then on the capital side, it's really looking at what type of funds do we have for capital improvements? And this year, City Council is adopting a five-year capital plan. So actually thinking about what things we want to be able to do in the next five years, um, because these are large-scale projects, right? I mean, $30 million to do a road doesn't just happen you know, over a year. It takes multiple years. And so the capital plan is another tool. Um, and all of this information is available on our website. And all of those meetings are open to the public, and um, the public has an opportunity to give comments. Yes, is that correct? That is true. And you can go to this book, and it's tabs, so you don't have to like read the whole thing. Um, and you can go by department, and you can look at general fund and administration or human resources, and you can see everything that's being spent um, by your city. Uh, so I just wanted to piggyback on that because the county is doing their budget too. So the county is doing their budget too. We're in the process of doing the budget for the 2018. We also do the same thing. We are working on a budget right now. We have a brief uh, or a draft proposal done right now. We're going to solidify that and vote on it in December to lock in the budget for 2018. We have for the 2017 budget, every year after we pass a budget, we do a brief and we put this out so that people can read it. It's kind of a, a uh, Reader's Digest version of what we've done in the budget. But we also publish the, the entire budget online as does city, the City of Commerce City for you to read so you know where that 27 mils that we're getting is being spent as far as the county. And we also partner with the city on a lot of the projects that they are doing so that we can pull the money and we can get a bigger project done in a better time frame. So we've done all of that. We also have an Adams County um, community report that we put out every year, and that's the tw this is the 2017 one. We'll come up with all of this again next year. Just wanted to throw that in. The state, by the way, does the same, and you can go on to ledge.colorado.gov and have access to all of that, which also, by the way, is you have an opportunity to make your voice heard on any decision that's made at the legislature. Jason. Just to add uh, a little bit to Michelle's comments about the city budget, um, one of the things I hear or see regularly in social media is this sense, the sense of sentiment that uh, well, because the population is growing, we must have a bigger pool of taxes from which to draw. So where do those dollars go, right? That perception. The reality is when growth is primarily residential, you're adding cost. You're not adding revenue, right? So it costs more to take care of a growing city. I have more lane miles to plow. I have more uh, asphalt to maintain. I have more sidewalks to maintain. So those are all costs. What changes the equation is when you grow the tax base. The, the, the net contribution to the formula. And so this is where the, the growth of businesses that I know many want to see comes into play. So when we fund schools well, and we create an in, intriguing and inviting environment for businesses to show up in, that show up of, of business means I'm paying out salaries, I'm having to pay suppliers, I'm increasing that whole mix of sales and use tax that we talked about. And I just wanted to touch on, uh, Michelle earlier talked about the sales and use tax uh, number, right? The, the rough math of that, just out of curiosity, is about 80% of that, I think, or maybe you did say that, right? Is paid by businesses, right? Not you and I. So when City Council considered how to raise that revenue for the 2K parks, roads, etc., we were very conscious of the fact that there was a ceiling that we didn't want to go over in terms of property tax. That was not even in the discussion. We looked at ways to address that ongoing revenue in a way that balanced it on people coming through and being in our city, not just on the people that live here, if that makes sense. And to be clear, you asked the voters to approve and that. We suggested that the voters approve them. Okay. 
Okay. Here we are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Before you go, I just wanted to add about the, <clears throat> the senior exemption. There's also a veteran's exemption as well. So if you're disabled vet, it also qualifies you the same way. You, if you need an application, you can get for either the seniors or the veterans. You can get it online, or if you call our office, we'd be happy to mail it to you. Thanks for adding that. And Michelle. I happen to be disabled. Oh, all right. And you, should, then, you should get that application, sir. Does the tenure requirement exist for the disabled veterans? No, no. no, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, Michelle, snow rem removal priorities. Yes. Um, always get re the alleys get removal, the gallery gets removal, for example, but 107th and Unity Parkway doesn't. <laughs> Can I? So. <laughs> I I'm going to take this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so, this is, this is confusing, right? So, and I'm going to look at our Metro District team here because if you look at the Metro District website, one of the things you see on that list is a, a function of the district is snow removal. We talked about special districts in the city. There is this interesting little dissection of our community, things that are the responsibility of the city, things that are the responsibility of the Metro District. The city publishes a snow removal plan. In fact, we just published the, the new... Oh, sorry. <laughs> but you can go on our website and you can see exactly the roads that the city cares for, given the intensity of the event. The district, I don't know that I see in a map, but certain parts of the neighborhood are cared for, the multifamily and the, the, the parkways, there's a snow plan that they right. have and I don't have access to that, if that makes well, sense. Well, it's not even that that uh, straightforward because there are sub HOAs within Reunion, so if you're living in a more of an attached multifamily product, your snow removal is going to be through that sub HOA. Uh, there is a sub district in Reunion that assesses a very small mill levy for the purposes of maintenance of the alleyways. Alley loaded products, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> there's noise in the background. Um, and then the metro district itself does take care of sidewalks and um, like around the rec center and things like that. So it's, it's not just a cut and dry. The city does everything or the metro district does everything. It's, it's a combination of many different parts and pieces. What I will say on the snow is um, if you go to c3gov.com backslash snow, I pulled it up, we do, as uh, Councilman McAnally said, we have a snow removal plan. We have three different priorities. Priority one are your main streets. Priority two are key arterials. Um, and then priority three are lower level streets. A lot of our neighborhood streets are what we call priority four, which unless it dumps four feet or so, we're probably not coming. So, um, are I, bus routes a priority? Bus routes, bus routes like 104th would be a priority, yes. Or school bus. School buses? Michelle, we have similar snow removal efforts, and just remember that even though it dumps a foot or more or two feet, and now you fall into that category four, they are not going to touch that until they do the categories ones, category twos, category threes. So like Denver sometimes contracts out to private snowplows, it's up to the city council or the county or whoever you're under that jurisdiction to kind of release that to go out that way. Schools are on schools, access to schools is a route. I don't know what priority it is off the top of my head, but c3gov.com snow is going to be your best bet. And we are launching, and you'll see this in the newsletter in November, a new interactive website where when there's a snow event, you'll be able to see, uh, you'll actually be able to add your address in and find out where you are where you are in the map and what the priority is. Um, mostly what we're finding is that most residents live very close to a priority one, two, or three street. So if you can get out, you should be able to get going. What if alleys are a priority, what priority are your alleys? Alleys would not be a priority for the city. I think this is where I was trying to suggest yeah. that an alley is not conveyed to the city. Yeah. When we talk about like the public roads, that's the that's everything from the sidewalk out, right? The the alleys by and large are part of the metro and I district. I understand what you're saying, but the alleys always get plowed and the main roads going down and the arteries does oh, so, so the metro district is outperforming the city on yes. snow removal. So is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, this is where, this is okay. where the, snow, yeah. the snow website will be helpful to see what's going on. Yeah, I've right. seen We see what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so snow will come, and hopefully removal will as well. Um, this is a question that's 
uh, directed really at myself and Chaz. How was this meeting communicated? If I hadn't seen it on Nextdoor, I wouldn't have known about it. No one is here meeting poorly communicated. So this is a town hall um, that um, Commissioner Tedesco and I, because we are in the Facebook group, saw the concerns over taxes and thought, what can we do to bring something to our community? So I paid out of my own pocket to promote this on Facebook, because this is not sponsored by anybody. Um, Chaz pulled money together to bring some drinks and some cookies, and next time we'll bring coffee. Um, I'm paying out of my pocket for the janitor for the school. Um, we're a member of the community like you are. We had questions. We wanted those questions answered as well. And because the questions are so, I mean, if you're in the Facebook group, you know what I'm saying when I say the comments can be maybe sometimes contentious. Um, and, and we wanted to make sure that we were just giving you information. And so that we can still have the conversations on Facebook, but maybe we know, uh, have a little bit more insight. That being said, further on in this question, um, and it's really uh, here to you here, instead of explaining why our taxes are, are like they are, the formulas, et cetera, um, and not asking if we supported it, why not explain how we can get taxes under control? And I really isn't, you know, it wasn't part of your conversation, but we have, uh, you've heard it over and over again, we have something called Tabor in Colorado. And what that means, and I said it really briefly at the beginning, but your elected officials do not have the authority to increase your taxes. Any taxes that you are paying are because the voters approved them. And we approved them in these areas. So when we come to you and we ask for taxes, it's not that I'm saying, I'm gonna put this on the taxes whether you like it or not. I'm gonna say, hey, we need some more money to level up on our schools. Would you consider this tax? That's what Tabor says. Um, we can uh, decrease, we cannot increase. So that's why the assessment rate, for example, we're allowed to go down, we are not allowed to go up, period. So in terms of getting taxes under control, that's an individual voter decision. And, and I know that we all take it very seriously. Um, and so the question is, do we want the snow removed from our alley? Um, do we want the schools that are, are leveling up? Uh, did we decide to move out here? You know, I had a, I had a bill that died, um, it was killed, that would have said if you are buying or building a new home, and it was specifically because of comments I saw in Facebook, by the way. So if you're building a new home in Reunion, before you sign on any dotted lines, you would be able to go to a calculator and put that address in and see every single penny of taxes that you might find out about now at the closing. That way you can decide, just like Chris did, do I want to live in Reunion, because I, I happen to love living here and think it's an awesome community, or do I want to live in Brighton where I like the people there too and I don't have to pay so much in taxes? Colorado, because of Tabor, has us in such a unique situation where we want anything here, it's incumbent upon us to pay for it. And that's why we come to the voters to ask and you have the absolute authority as a voter to say no or to say yes. So, that's, yeah. that's yeah. in that I, just, yeah. Yeah. I want to give a lot of credit, congrats to Daphne because Daphne actually came to me and said, hey, you know, I feel like there's a need that we have to talk about taxes. I can tell you that she approached not only me, but other electeds. And we were, we were told as electeds, this is a, this is a, you know, hot topic. You're going to get roasted. You're going to, you're going to have, <laughs> you know, all these problems. We took a risk. This is a, we wanted to make sure that as public servants, we were acting like public servants. We wanted to make sure that you had information that you needed that was relevant to what you're going through. We may not be able to answer all those questions. We may not give you the, the answers you like, but we want to give you the information that you need. And we're gonna work with you going forward to make it work for everybody here. 
This is a pilot program, and to answer the question, how did we advertise it? We didn't know how to advertise it. We didn't know, you know, was it a mailing? Was it an email? Was it Well, and I paid for network? targeted advertising in Facebook to reach a, um, a wider area. I sent it out um, on my own uh, uh, email list. Um, I advertised it on my own Facebook page, um, and I went on Nextdoor, which I'm so glad to know that the next door paid off because somebody came. <laughs> so um, and I did it multiple door. times. Yeah. I tried pushing multiple times without getting kicked off for spamming. I am not on next door, <laughs> but I was also trying to put it out there. We have kind of shared the burden in this. We had to sign a, a uh, insurance with the school district just to be in this building. Wow. And that was my responsibility. Her responsibility was the payment of the, the yeah. janitors to unlock it. We also kind of coordinated our staff to bring in all of this so that we could be, you know, it was a pleasant environment, we could give you the information, and we could be responsive to anything that you have for us today. Um, so the final question on that sheet was, um, uh, we pay all this tax, where are the amenities? So what's the, 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 the prognosis on amenities? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a three week, uh, my three weeks in answer, but I travel <laughs> all over the country. Um, I've been doing this for 20 some years and travel all over the country, um, and, and, and predominantly is around schools, what makes great communities great, and school, I was really focused on schools at the time, but I can tell you, it's really, and I wanna go back to something Michelle said, she kinda of stole my thunder when we started this. Less than 20 years ago, this was a dry lands wheat farm, okay? Less than 20 years ago. They did sunflowers, they grew wheat, non-irrigated, so a true, if you've been on the Eastern Plains, we're in the Eastern Plains. This is where they grew winter wheat. So fast forward, so the first house was 2002-ish in uh, Reunion. Reunion. Uh, that's when the rec center opened. And one of the things that, so think, think back 20 years ago. I remember coming out here, I think, a week or two after the community opened. And it was not easy to get out here, right? I mean, you didn't have a lot of the infrastructure we have now to, to transportation infrastructure to get out here. And Shay, I mean, think about again who they were competing against, front loaded a lot of these amenities, which you typically don't see. They built the main park, they built the two lakes, they built the rec center. Um, they front loaded a lot of those amenities to attract folks out here uh, to compete against Stapleton and some of the other developments, master plan developments. And that was a business decision they made, and it was a successful one. Obviously, the world changed after the recession. Um, different, very different world, but pre-recession, it was a successful strategy. There was a lot of excitement about reunion uh, in Commerce City early on. So now you've got all, you've got actually a pretty amenitized community. So I'll use Stapleton as an example because I I worked in Denver now the last six years. Is you know Stapleton had a rec center that was a separate cost right through a city bond to build a rec center. So uh, the fact that you guys have your own rec center is unique. Uh, and I think we now as Oakwood, uh, one of the things you'll hear us do and, and you'll hear our team do with uh, Metro staff is we're starting to walk the community because now we're 15 years into these amenities. Now they have to be replaced and maintained. And I certainly have seen an early survey uh, that we got a lot of response about. We're not maintaining the, uh, the community is not being maintained appropriately. So one of the things I think you'll hear us ask question is, if we have to prioritize resources, how do we prioritize those resources to get ahead of mulch or tree replacement or whatever that happens to be? So that's something you have a commitment from us that we'll start doing that. And that's what I want to use those coffees for and maybe we'll do some more survey work and I'm gonna ask Denise to fill in the blanks. But I'm just, I'm trying to give you a perspective from around the country that I can't think of many communities in the front range that have the level of landscaping finishes that, that Reamy has. Um, Stapleton probably is a close second, but again, uh, state, uh, Forest City guys did a lot of parks and some of the open space, and they had some cleanup responsibilities as well uh, through some both local and federal dollars to clean up the old airport. So uh, all that being said, every community is a little different. Uh, this one's unique in that the Metro District has to maintain these assets as well, and they're not turned over to the city. Yeah. Denise? Yeah, yeah, I can. Jason has some, some notes here. Um, He's noting that the district has about 150 acres of landscaping maintained by the district and more than total landscaping 
uh, than the culmination of all the private yards in reunion, which means that the Metro District maintains the equivalent of about 5,000 square feet per home in reunion, in addition to what your private yards will bring to your personal use. Um, and in the water budget, I don't know if you probably all don't really think about how water works. You know, you turn your faucet on and the water comes out, or you turn your sprinklers on and the water comes out. Um, but there, uh, you, there's a lot that goes into that process of getting water to your community. And reunion, and I can't remember the exact comparison number, but um, you know, when maybe five years ago, before the before the economy started to tick back up, Reunion was sitting on about um, five million square feet of landscaping for a community that only had 1,400 homes at the time. And just based on my experience in this industry, that's probably about five times more than would normally be the case in any given other given community. And it's really because of uh, the developer's commitment to trying to make a special, unique place for people to enjoy and to live in. And they obviously couldn't anticipate at the time that the economy would take the downturn that it did. So they were really forward thinking and visionary and trying to get set forth um, an environment that people would be able to enjoy ahead of a normal development uh, schedule based on just house um, rooftops. So it's sort of the both sides of, um, of, this, of the, I don't know, coin. The, the coin. That's right. <laughs> I can't remember the colloquialism. But so you, you got the landscaping, but you also have some costs that are associated with it. Good news is, is that Oakwood is here. They're uh, planning on a, some more active development. You'll have a little bit more households to share some of the tax burden. And uh, you really do have a beautiful community. I've had the pleasure of working here for a good many years and I think it looks better now than it's looked as long as I've been working here so uh, it's been great to be here with you all and uh, we're all available outside of this meeting if you need some yeah, questions answered as well. Well that's a great segue. Um, I wanted to point out with thanks to my aide and my husband um, I did also advertise on my website where I post all of my town halls um, and that's DaphnaForColorado.com if you want to just get on the list about town halls. I'm going to ask everybody here to you know yeah, a one, two sentence wrap up if there's anything that you want to add. And then um, I am also going to take all of these unasked questions, type them up, have them answered. If you signed up and gave me your email address on the list, I will send those answers out. I will also post them in Facebook. I will also note on Nextdoor, because I don't think I can post them on Nextdoor, but I'll note on Nextdoor that they're in the Reunion Facebook group. So uh, final thoughts. Any? Um, my only thought is that it is important that we think about how we tax ourselves and whether or not we believe that the best way to do it is by limiting what we get based upon how, our willingness to individually pay for it or do we want to think about the benefits of community and how they extend beyond just a particular neighborhood. We are decision makers on taxes in the state of Colorado. I really appreciate everybody taking the Saturday afternoon to come learn about it. We're really good, all of us, and expecting our electeds to know what's going on. And as I started my presentation in Colorado, we are the decision makers on taxes. So congratulations for sort of living up to the standard of being informed decision makers. Um, and if you have any, we will, I'll be sharing uh, my presentation. And if you're uh, interested in contacting my organization, please reach out. We do talk to folks uh, about all kinds of these issues, and we'd, we'd be happy to talk to a group that you might want to put together. Well, I would just like to say, you know, values have gone skyrocketed, they just have, and there's really not much that we can do about that. You have to look at both sides of the coin. One side, of course, is the downside with the property taxes that come with it. But the other side is, is if you're newer in your home and you have uh, private mortgage insurance, the PMI, if you talk with your lenders and stuff, that could possibly come off with the increase in the equity that you have in the home. So you have to kind of look at where you can capitalize on the increases the best that you can. And if you have any questions about anything regarding your property, please don't hesitate to call us at the office, or you can call me personally. My cards are over here. I answer every phone call, so please take the time, and I'm happy to spend the time to explain whatever I can.
So thank you for choosing to live in Commerce City and for coming today. I think we have a great city, and it's a great city in large part because of everybody in this room and our elected officials. Um, we're really accessible, and we try to put a lot of information online, but we're also really, it, you're able to call us. So I have cards here too, and um, please feel free to call us at any time, but we're here to you. You are um, every employee's boss in this city and we really want to meet your expectations so um, if we aren't or we can do better or there's another question please let us know and i will let my wife know that she was way off on the over under <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness uh, thanks to chad and for put this together i think this is a wonderful turnout um, you know we've got an extended um, mm -hmm. uh, nice summer and fall here and it's, it's, we got the right at the moment a great yesterday it was almost hot uh, so you could be doing a thousand other things today than learning about tax taxes in Colorado. So I want to commend you for coming out. Um, I already have to mention, and um, Carol alluded to this, we're not only unique in how we do taxes in Colorado, we're the only direct democracy tax policy state in the union. We're the only ones doing this, um, which creates uh, just a great opportunity for us all as individual voters. But back to the collective good. We're missing the boat on some things. Um, that's my bias around how we try to get things done specifically for kids. So, but thanks for coming out. Um, for Kelly, for I, I just I want to thank Chaz and Daphne for hosting this. I mean, this is this is a great turnout. I've been to thousands of community meetings. This is a really good turnout on a on a nerdy topic. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, on behalf of myself, so again, I you know I'm doing kind of a 90 day entry plan in the community. I've been walking. I'm going to continue that. I'm going to get my office out here this next year. Mention the coffee house. Oakwood is a long term partner in the communities in which it does work. I, one of the first meetings I had was with the superintendent. We're a huge investor in schools um, and programming to make communities great. Uh, but this turnout, you know, another thing that makes communities great is being active in your community. And, and we need folks to be informed. We need folks to show up. Hopefully you found this valuable. I certainly did today. Uh, and I just really look forward to working with you, uh, with the city and this community uh, here tomorrow and the next day and next month to balance of the year and into next year. So thank you. And before um, I let Chaz say his final words, um, a really big uh, round of applause for Commissioner Tedesco because it's because of him that all of these people are sitting here. So, I just want to say that, you know, Daphne is incredible. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't her coming and saying we need to come out and we need to reach out. We work together. It wasn't just Daphne and I, it was a willingness of all of these people sitting up here to come out and talk to you because listen, they were, they were, you know, skeptical of what the response was going to be, what the atmosphere was going to be. I hope that we've achieved what you wanted and that is to get you the information. It may not complete everything, but it's a start. But I hope what you can do is let us know what worked, what didn't work, what you'd like to see, what maybe didn't make any sense, so we can evaluate that and we can do this again, but maybe with some of our other partners and right. bring them out. And I'd like to say, um, Councilman Douglas and Councilman Malcoldowney also had input in who was at this table to make sure that the questions they keep hearing from you were also answered. So it's, I don't know if we're entirely unique, but I know that my other colleagues in the state don't talk about having town halls with their commissioners or with their city councilors, um, but that's the only way we get things done at every level in a short amount of time. So we hope to be able to provide more of this. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we're going to hang around if you have any further questions. And Real final quick, words. I just need to make sure if you have anything on the tables, please help us. We, we have to put the tables back. <laughs> I'll, put, I'll put the tables back the way they were, but if you could take all your trash and put everything away and take anything else that you brought with us, we'd make our way. Thank you.